Well then, to get that audio check out the way, as some of you have noticed, I've done some studio changes, repositioned my calendar, so you, I mean my camera, so you can see, you can see even closer way back here. You can see all all these. You should be able to see a lot better now. I won't always do it this way because sometimes I need my camera to be further back. But this is just simple q and I don't believe I'll be presenting a lot, so I don't need to reach up here. <clears throat> good. I got nobody saying, nobody saying my audio is bad, so that's good. Audio is good. Excellent. And I, I'm assuming that if I hang back here, my audio is pretty good, too. Shouldn't, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't. Uh. Shouldn't be much different. I haven't really experimented. This is a uh, kind of new, so we'll figure it out. Yeah, y'all leave Billy alone. I'm not talking about Billy today, dude. Dude's toxic, real toxic. My t-shirt, thank you. Thank you, Warren a Dream. That's Anubis. That's Anubis right there. That's the man himself. Yeah, man. That's what the Sphinx was before the water damage for 340 years below the Mediterranean when the North African plate had gone down and put that brown stain on the, on the Great Pyramid's casing blocks, according to Al Baruni, a thousand years ago. Some of you, some of you guys have speculated that in modern times, those casing blocks were removed to hide that, to hide that. I don't know. I just don't know. That's not what the historical records claims, but you never know. You just never know. So Dawn, Dawn is uh, getting some of your questions just to get me started. This is a and I'm not doing a presentation, although answering a lot of questions ends up being a presentation. Um, I am. I'm fully on board with a three hour session. Either tonight or tomorrow, I'll be sending my draft of my personal invitation to a discussion about Atlantis dating to Mr. Graham Hancock himself. And you guys know I'm not blowing smoke up anybody's butt. I will I will post. I will post that email to the community on YouTube so you can read it. Every call out I do will be posted on YouTube. All right. Yeah, ask your questions in all in all caps. <clears throat> Somebody said, uh, talk about the April 8th uh, eclipse. I mean, okay, since the, since the advent of social media, I was in prison. I didn't get out until 2016. So, but many of you were already in the communities, you know. How many eclipses? You remember all the hubbub about 2017 eclipse? How many times have the, has the subject of eclipses how come your people just aren't burned out, burned out from it by now? Nothing has ever happened. Any eclipse, any eclipse that has occurred in American history that was known to happen, nothing. Absolutely nothing. So it's just crazy. It's crazy. So I'm no, I'm not just not, I'm just not a the eclipses don't really mean anything to me. Now, when the sun darkens, like that book right there, that's the title of that book. Man, it's hard. There it is. When the sun darkens. But it's not talking about eclipses. It's talking about the Phoenix phenomenon. Because this is q and I just wanted you guys to see. Here are some of my published books. These are the ones released by Booktree. Uh, the Giants book. Nephilim book's not up there because he's reprinting that right now. But yeah, and then Chronicon was five books, but now it's just one. It's gigantic, but it's huge, but it's just really one book. Started off as five. 
And on the very end, down there, is my Dagathar book. That is a that is literally a chronicon for an for a fantasy world that uh I had pretty much written an extensive story masking the Phoenix phenomenon as something else, the return of the broken moon. And it's an it's a fairy apocalypse, it's a fairy world, and how and how the uh really really the kingdoms of men have made the fairies go into banishment and hiding and how an ancient race of fairies that were in the underworld have been surviving for a long time and they finally hear about what's going on on the surface world they didn't know that their kin that they had left a long time ago on the surface were going through some terrible shit so my story is called the Phalorn saga and you can hear it for free i have another channel my other channel is called Phalorn Saga. Uh, one of my moderators can post the link here, but I've already got uh, 42 or 43 videos that you can check out, like chapters in a book. Some of them are hour long. Some of them are, uh, you know, 10, 20 minutes. But it's a it's an epic story called the Phalorn Saga, and I basically took all the archaic concepts, the Phoenix phenomenon, and I repackaged it into the story of a, like a, a Lord of the Rings meets Star Wars type story. It's got, it does have science fiction in it, but it's kept in the background. It's mainly sword and sorcery, but it's got deep philosophical undertones all throughout all throughout the story. It's called the Phalorn Saga, and that book is a full chronological history going back like thirty thousand years, and the whole giving you the back histories of all the characters because the characters of my story are all hundreds of years old, thousands of years old, and they have extensive histories. And it's the reason why they do what they do in the story. So that's what that last book is. It's just a, it's just a chronicle of, of all the kingdoms and races of, of uh, Dagathar. So pretty soon, Don will bring me that first paper. We're getting close to the meetup, guys. We're getting real close to that meetup. Daniel Quinn, are you new to my channel? I have discussed that before. I'll mention it again. I just I just picked it off randomly. Daniel Quinn, I'm gonna go ahead and post his his uh, question here. Archaics, wondering about the statement: "Men will seek death and shall not find it." What experience will this be for survivor survivors of the initial consequences of the apocalypse? Okay, well, first of all, the apocalypse is only preparatory. It's like a prologue for the Great Tribulation, which is the which is the boss of all resets. There it is, the boss, the big boss reset. Not these little minor resets we've gone through. This is the big boss reset, and it takes the apocalypse is the unveiling. It's basically when it's when We've been lied to so much, and for so long, the apocalypse is is organized by the benefactor. Although the elite and the enemy, artificial intelligence X, does use it to their advantage, like they're doing. But the but the apocalypse is all about the absolute disclosure of everything that's real. That doesn't mean that the enemy is not also releasing all these different uh, uh, paradigms as well that are that's unreal. I mean, we got you got some really crazy stuff going on. It's 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 slap you in the face. It's slap you in the face. Uh, disrespectful how they do. It. I mean, I'll give you one. I'll give you one example. Some of the greatest names you guys have heard in 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 media that were really pushing the jab and were really pushing. You need to take this. You need to take that. Uh. Oh, you're not patriotic if you don't. Or you're not. You're not this if you don't. You're not worried about the safety of your family if you don't. Listen, man. These people are really, really guilt tripping people and talking about you need to trust the science and all this stuff in 2020. Yeah, names like Weinstein. Yeah, there's two of them. Two brothers named Weinstein. They were real heavy on it. Now all of a sudden the public forgives them. All these media elite have now done podcasts with them talking about, oh, yeah, man, we understand you're mistaken, man. And, and yeah, openly on media, just forgave these forgave these guys. And now it's the same, it's the same guys now pushing, uh, now telling us what we already know. This is all cover, guys. This is slapping your face revelations. We already know 
that the migrants are a fifth column. We already know that the whole second seal is designed to take peace from the earth in the form of small arms warfare, attacks against the infrastructure, all these things against the, against the West. We already know it's going to be in retaliation for what Israel did to Gaza. All this we already know, but now you have the Weinstein guys out there publicly on X and all be doing podcasts now informing informing Congress and informing everybody who will listen that oh yeah, there's a real problem. These migrants are all military age. Oh, there's a real problem. It looks like a standing army. Oh, it's a real problem. We think there's there's weapons caches all spread out. There's something going on here. Yeah, it's it's disclosure, guys. They're telling you exactly. 100% the truth and acting like they're the ones that are disclosing it. They're, they're the ones. So every bit of this is so that ex post facto, they can always look like they have clean hands. Meaning when all this is done, done and said this year in 2024, and we go into 2025 and people are looking to blame people, just like the COVID, everybody's looking to blame people for the COVID. When people are looking to blame someone for the attacks against the infrastructure and all that, most people won't even think about blaming Texas. Why? Because Texas so out loud uh, opposed Biden's administration. They were very vocal and out loud about, about opposing all the migrants coming in, but they were only out loud and actually doing something about it eight years after it started. Yeah, guys, it's all smoke and mirrors. Everybody, everybody in the media, everybody at the top, at the top levels are playing ball. I hate to tell you guys over and over and over, but there are no good guys in politics. Yeah. I used to be 40 years of my life, Southern Baptist, twice, twice baptized, but born, you guys already know, born again. Oh, listen, I used to be that guy. Not anymore. I researched myself right out of that paradigm. Used to be ultra conservative. When I started my channel, I was an ultra conservative Trump supporter. The only time I have ever voted in my life was when the state of Texas reinstated my rights. I got all my rights back. I served my sentence. I have paid my debt to society for dumbass stuff I was involved in when I was 17 years old. State of Texas sent me my paperwork. I'm absolutely a free man. Then a week later, I got a voter registration card. I was so happy to get that vote. I was wagging my tail. I went all the way to the county, registered my card. I went in there and I voted on their machines and I voted for Trump in 2020. And I was sick when, 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 when Biden won. And I even released some videos, and I, I, talk, I, talk, I talked about it, but I've grown a whole lot in the past four years, and now I understand. I never really did research Trump, didn't know much about him, but now I do. I know everything about that man. I had no idea that I had voted for a wolf in sheep's clothing. And, I, and, I, and you know what? It's crazy. The people that organize all of this are so genius. They are so genius. They have set it up to where if you even call suspicion towards Trump now, you're painted as un-American, unpatriotic, a Biden liberal supporter. Yeah, you're woke. Don't even know. Don't even know. They literally put the devil on the podium. And I, I couldn't even believe it. I, I, all the research I've done, I now understand. These people who, who basically rule this construct they're absolute geniuses at what they do. And they are 10 steps ahead of the rest of us. Yeah. But during the apocalypse, which we're in, 2020, COVID-19 was the breaking of the first seal. The human family was attacked by the servants of Apollo of Pharmakia. This is what happened. Now, we're going to go deeper into that. I've already told you about the second seal. We might, we'll talk more about the second seal when I do my Olympic decodes. But we're going to go deep on the third and the fourth seal as well. It wasn't an accident that Dawn went, went on a, uh, uh, I'm going to answer that question, Daniel, about the death, uh, that will seek death and not find it. But the apocalypse, it wasn't an accident that after, after a year since her friend's passing, she got the ashes and she went on a short trip. And it was without me. And it just so happened to be some small rinky-dink little antique store that she never remembered was even there. 
and saw it. So she decided to go in and there was a book, the only book behind a glass case. Cause all the other books she looked at, I wasn't interested in, she wasn't interested in, but she looked at this glass case and asked the lady behind the case, what, well, why is this book in a glass case? And the lady says, Oh, it's just really like a display. I'm, uh, nobody's ever been interested in it. Uh, it's, it's a $400 book. So, Don says, $400, what is it? So the lady told her, it's like a dictionary. So Don pressed her in to look at the book and pulled it out. This is a English, it's huge. This is a English Greek, English to Greek lexicon. Absolutely perfect for decoding the book of Revelation. This was published in 1852. It's amazing. This is what I'll be using right here to, to decode the rest of the book of Revelation. 1852. I don't know why it ain't showing clear. Giant book. Micro print. It's a mega book. So anyway, I just wanted to show you guys that. That's my something I'm working on right now. So I'm gonna uh, hide that. So right now, right now they're telling us the truth. They're doing open disclosures all the time. At the same time that they're also releasing a tremendous amount of lies, such as extraterrestrial invasions, extraterrestrial contact, sightings, all, all these, all the, listen guys, all that is, BS. you already know it's BS. Everything is to get your focus off the ground. Get your focus from what is happening underneath us. Even these old trucker convoys, they're still doing what they did in 2020 and 2021 with the trucker convoys. They paint it as something that it is not. To normalize when when people see hundreds of trucks going down the highway at one time. They need to normalize that. They don't care what you believe. They don't care if you believe it's a it's a bunch of patriots that are that are protesting Canada. They don't care if if you believe that it's a whole bunch of people coming together to go to go help Texas on the border. They don't care what you believe. They throw these narratives out so that you will believe something. When what's really happening is I told you, I told you as back as far back as three years ago, they're filling up all these warehouses and commissaries in the underworld. They have deep earth biospheres, underground infrastructure, all being laid out. There's only 16 more years left, guys, and they're going to be sealed in those facilities underground way before that. They're not going to wait till 2040. I promise you that. I believe by 2036, they'll be safely sealed, gone, hermetically sealed, and distributed. Just like, you know, I've already shown you the evidence, guys. Even 1902, when, when they came back up in 1902, oh my God, you've seen my last 1902 video. Read the comments section in my 1902 video, and you will learn about a whole bunch of other stuff other people have found out about what was released in the public all, the, all of a sudden in 1902 and 1903. Yeah, I thought I found a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> so your question is about death shall flee from them. I've, I've addressed this on my channel before because this is... This is a part of vapor canopy, vapor canopy biosphere. It's different than the biosphere we have now. And it can be very, it can, it can quickly return. All it takes is submarine volcanoes, and it doesn't take a lot of them to, be, to begin erupting. Some surface volcanoes erupt. It won't even take very long uh, for the skies to fill with pumice and ash. Once a dust veil encapsulates the sky it's over once once that happens an increase of atmospheric pressure happens with the phoenix coming it, the upper mesosphere is also blanketed not just the lower mesosphere the upper mesosphere is also blanketed it's blanketed with red particulates that come off of phoenix every 138 years 
And you know, in 1902, there was a whole bunch. You know, there was a red mud. Remember, guys, there were scientists that were baffled. There were ship captains that were uh, that, that, that had to call all hands on deck just to get people to push this red dirt off of their ships before their ships capsized. In Australia alone, 50 tons of red dust per square mile was recorded in 1902. Yeah, I've had I've had some guys from 1902 send me a jar. I showed it on my channel of the red conglomerates that that was, conglomerate that fell from the sky and was in this 1902 strata. They were convinced it was from from what I was talking about. And they sent it to me. Yeah, it's a uh, it's amazing, guys. Depends on where you are. A lot of times it's red dust. Sometimes it's red rain. Sometimes it's red mud. But it's a uh, it also has organic materials in it. And this, this is what baffled people in 1902 and 1903 when they were studying this. So to answer your question, in an environment where the human body is now subject to ambient radiation from volcanoes, like two scientists in 1902 who both grew two inches, and these men were 58 years old and older, the human body is going to heal much faster with rapidity. So in the book of Revelation, apparently the vapor canopy is going to come back so thick that even the trumpet judgments refer that one third of the sun is gone, one third of the moon, one third of the stars, one third of the day, one third of the night. We have a visibility restriction. We have all this going on, but we also have the world spinning faster. It doesn't matter if you think it's a pizza on a, a, a spinning around a, an axis or if you think it's a beach ball. It doesn't even matter because all movement is simulated by a moving sky. I do not believe the ground has moved at all. That's just me. That's just where my dad has taken me. So this uh, in the tribulation, it talks about it talks about people will people will seek death and not be able to find it well this is this goes back to the to the story of like Cain and Abel I'm not saying the story of Cain, Cain and Abel is true I'm saying that it is a story that exemplifies what it's like to live under a vapor canopy and trying to kill someone all right murder murder is a crime that has been committed hundreds of millions of times even outside the context of war Hundreds of millions of times. But the book of Genesis plays special attention to the very first murder, according to uh, uh, the book of Genesis. However, other books in the Bible say it's not the first murderer because it talk, 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 talks about Satan and Lucifer, who was a murderer from the beginning. And this is way before Cain and Abel. So we have the story that Cain kills Abel and He's cursed and he's sent out into the land, a land of as a wanderer. And there's other people out there as well. Well, we can we can more readily understand the thank you, Merrill. Say so we can we can uh, more readily understand the severity of such a curse when you understand that in a vapor canopy world, it's not easy to kill somebody. You have to work for it. You're gonna have to want them dead. For them to for them to die, because under a heightened atmospheric pressure, the benefits of ambient radiation in a world that is moving faster, the sky is moving faster, day and night are happening faster. Human physiology is to the point where we are healing just as fast as we are being hurt. So to kill somebody, you're going to have to work for it. That's the message that's being conveyed here. This is why during the Great Tribulation period, it, the death the death uh, toll is not going to be near as high as you think it's going to be. People are going to be able to survive all this. They're just not going to want to survive it. This is what, hope, that's, that was my first question. I sure hope all the questions aren't this dark, but I just grabbed that one from the, from the list. All right, so I'm going to pay attention to this paper, guys, because I got people going through it. Yes, Brian Donovan, 
some dumbs will not survive. That's right. That's why they spread themselves out. The elite have been doing this for a long time, guys. I've shown, I have another video where I show that the elite absolutely know all about this, and it's in my occultist mysterium. I show in the artwork, all, all the medieval to the Renaissance iconography in the, in the architecture, the statuary. I show in the alchemical treatises, the knowledge of the Phoenix resets is real. They know about it, and the whole story is painted all through the alchemical medieval literature. It's amazing. That one video is like three and a half hours, but it's worth your time to understand that uh, this is this is some deep stuff, and, and it makes sense of all all this all, all these secret societies that have put out all these treatises. It shows you what what they really know. This is the information they hold back. <clears throat> All right. I don't know. Which, let me see which one's first. I don't know. Let's see. Okay. Jen Just, question. Are you in any danger from the wildfires that are apparently raging through Texas? Two answers. One, I, I am hundreds of miles from that location. Texas is gigantic. I'm in Central East Texas. That's in Northwest Texas. I'm not, I'm not in any danger. Two, uh, it's not my time. Yeah, I'm a, I, my informed field is on a daily basis interfacing with the overfield of the construct. This is why we get premonitions. This is where we borrow power from. Remember, we draw from ourselves more than we contain. This is right now, there is nothing in the field that is out there that is showing any type of signals of harm toward Jason. I'm hypersensitive to that. No, I'm not worried about, it. I'm not worried about the fires. Not, I, I feel for what's going on out there. Uh, I believe it was a weapon. There's nothing natural about it, but no, it has nothing to do with me and my existence right now. And like I said, it's on the other side of Texas and Texas, Texas is bigger than a lot of countries. It's just, there's no, there's nothing there. Nothing to it. Thanks for asking, but I'm not worried. Okay, Heath Taylor, is life just fogging on our brain to be conscious of something that is, wow, I, I, yeah, is life just fogging on our brain to be conscious of something that is beyond money and time? Oh. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. These need to be, these need to be filtered. Is life just fogging on our brain to be conscious of something that is beyond money and time? I'm going to pass on that. I, I'm, 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 I'm going to pass because any answer I give may not even be what you're going. I don't, I don't understand. All right. Oh, uh, Cug, Cug. Does Matthew 24 have any correlations to Phoenix uh, to Phoenix uh, or Nibiru? All right, well, check it out. Matthew 24 is very unique. It's a part of the sayings of Jesus. These are the original writings of the New Testament before the church got involved and invented Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the uh, uh, in the original Markion sayings of Jesus, there is a chapter from which Matthew 24 derives where Jesus is prophesying a lot of things. And what's very intriguing is that Jesus is specific. He says that uh, uh, in the in the uh, um, was it in the sun was it the sun will the sun will grow dark and the moon will turn red. There will be earthquakes in the sea and tumultuous places, and all of this will occur before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. This is exactly what we find with the with the unveiling of the seals as well. The sixth seal, which is Mother Shipton's sixth sky dragon. The sixth seal is the darkening of the sun. Uh, uh, it specifically says, and the sun goes black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon turns red, and stones fall from the sky. And then... Uh, the mountain, then there's mighty earthquakes and people, the kings and the people hide in the caves and the rocks from the face of the one, from the face of God. And, and, uh, this is all the 
the event of the month of May 2040. This is the Phoenix phenomenon, and it is a part of the apocalypse, not the tribulation. As a matter of fact, it is the last event. It's the final event of the of the unveiling of the apocalypse, because the seventh seal isn't anything in our world. When the seventh seal is broken, a silence is introduced into the into the field. It's a it's a preparatory waiting period for the first of the woes, the great judgments that are, that are to follow. This will resume in 2046. So, this uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting. Jesus Jesus was chronology in eschatology. Jesus chronology in Matthew 24 mirror, mirrors exactly what we're going through now. And he was he was also very specific that there's going to be volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, but the end is not yet. And he was absolutely correct. Because uh, even when the Phoenix phenomenon happens in 2040, it's still 60 years away. However, 6.5 years later in 2046, which is the true end of the Mayan long count, time will collapse. It's the second trumpet judgment of the book of Revelation. And the Maya and the book of Revelation say the same thing about time. It's going to be fundamentally altered. And when it is, it's going to abbreviate that final 60 years to 40 years, because 20 years, one third will be shaved off. And the scripture says this is done to keep them from the evil to come. Because had not time been removed, no flesh would be saved. It also says in the book of Revelation that this is basically going to catch the evil one flat-footed. I mean, he is going to grow wrathful because he knows his time is short. His time has been cut off. This is also the central theme of the ancient seven kings of Sumer. Yeah, guys, the, the 670 years, which is 241,200 shars, or turning of the stars before the flood, was a 670-year period of eight kings, but only seven of them got to rule because their reign, their dynasty was cut off. This is in the Babylonian text, and it's mirrored again in the book of Revelation, where we have, and there were seven kings, and now eight. And and and, and the eighth was one of the seven, and he is restored because their reign had been cut off. This is Apollyon. This is the return of Apollo, who is first manifested in the apocalypse as a concept Apollo Pharmakia, but the whole ideal here with the elite in their transhumanist agenda is to give Apollo an avatar, and this will this will be accomplished after, long after all the seals are broken. We're only entering the second seal period right now. Each one of them is broken along the four-year episodes that the ancients called the Olympiads. So this was a part of the ancient Greek Pythian. This is the this is the calendar of the seers of the of the ancient oracles, uh, the game that the games celebrated. So this is why all the Olympics ceremonies, all the halftime shows, all that stuff have all this occult ritualism in them. They're, what they're doing is patterning. And when they pattern with a whole bunch of people all involved, it doesn't even matter if the individuals do not know what they're participating in. It's it's the actual physical movement of an avatar that that the the, the overfield can recognize is associated to another phenomenon. It calls up the energy of that other phenomenon. This is what this is the strength. This is the power behind ritual. This is why it's very dangerous to engage in activities for which you don't understand exactly what you're doing. This is all this is what the, the whole Olympics are about. Now <clears throat> yeah energy is always in the field. And just and just because just because energetic events in the past have now faded out into into newer events that no longer look like the older events the older energy is still there. It can always be tapped into. This is this is why it's very important to to understand, like like the law of attraction. You got to understand that there is a 
fundamental flaw in the law of attraction. This is why the book law by Rhonda Byrne and this whole concept put out in the secret and all that has distressed so many people and why so many people have just beaten themselves on the wall trying to figure out why why the law of attraction works for everybody else but doesn't work for them. But it's not. The law of attraction basically works for the individual who's teaching it, but it's not working for the listeners. And there's a, there's a reason why. And uh, most people aren't going to want to hear it. Uh, in my book, in my book, uh, right here, Awaken the Immortal Within. It's my best-selling book. Uh, I sell more from home than I do on Amazon, but it doesn't even matter. Uh, this book was given away. Over 10,000 PDFs have been distributed all over the world before it ever became. And a lot of you got them. Uh, a lot of you got it multiple times, but that book, Awaken the Immortal Within, I break it down to you as simple as possible. The greatest, the greatest harm the law of attraction has ever done was trying to teach you that in order to get the things that you want in life, you had to have a positive, a positive mind, a positive. That is not how reality works. I'm telling you now, the elite give what they want, and they're not positive about it all. It has nothing to do with positivity or negativity. It has everything to do with moving your avatar in a, in a, in an, basically by an avenue of expe expectation. If you move your physical avatar in the direction of a mental blueprint that you're operating by, and that avatar is moving with expectation of receiving it, you're going to get it. This is how the elite rule the world. This is how, this is how all these people that are, that are high up have, have become what they've become. It's, and it has nothing to do with altruism. It has nothing to do with being positive and making sure that what you're going to do is not going to hurt anybody else. God, this is all, it's a fundamental flaw in the law of attraction to think that morals have anything to do with how the construct is going to interface with you. Morals have everything to do with how you are going to interface with the oversoul. And the oversoul is all is always watching. And when we draw from ourselves more than we contain, it's coming from source. It's coming from the oversoul. And we're able to do that because we are spiritual beings. We don't strive. We don't strive to be good so that we can have a relationship with the oversoul. That's not how it works. We have a relationship with the oversoul because we are good. We have to look at these things from a totally different perspective than the way religionists try to hand them to us. You weren't born in sin. That's the great lie. And that's the great lie that will be peeled away in the tribulation period. When people realize, damn, it doesn't even matter if you're a religionist. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist. It doesn't matter if you're super spiritual. It doesn't, none of these things matter. None of these things matter. Because in the tribulation, all men will find out really quick, you're all equal. Except for those who understand that they, that they are connected to source. And the masses will see those few in their, in, in, around them and realize that they've been duped. They've been duped, guys. That's how deep this is. This is why so many people have just basically broke themselves on the rack of prayer. Don't even understand. Don't don't even don't even get it. 300 million prayers to end cancer has only perpetuated the phenomenon. This is how the construct works. You cannot lend, you cannot emanate energy and expect that for that image energy to be to be to be dissipated. It's not how it works. If you're if you're emitting energy about something you're worried about, all you're doing is bringing into the physical what was priorly only mental. You did that. You created it, and the construct merely acted as the divine mirror. I have many videos explaining this phenomenon. It is the divine mirror. You cannot blame the construct, cannot blame artificial intelligence X. You can't blame dungeon programming, can't blame any of those things. You are absolutely creating the perimeters of your life because you live in two fundamentally different realities. One of them is the collective and we phase into it all the time. One of them is the highly individualized 
immortal soul. And this is where all the true power lies. This is where all the dungeon programming chains fall off. This is where the connection to source can be felt. This is where you can draw from yourself far more than you would ever be able to hold within you. This is where all the magic happens. It's when you interface with the collective that you phase out of the personal. Once you phased out of the personal, you are now subject to the laws of the collective and you are no longer connected to source. You phase in and out between these two realities every single day and multiple times a day. And the better you become at understanding that you're a singularity and not a part of the collective and that that single, that singularity that is you is, is absolutely a manifestation of the immortal, eternal God then there's nothing in this construct that will ever be able to stop you from doing and being what you want to, to be and do. Multiple videos. This is the book that, outline, that outlines all this. And you have to understand, you've got to break free of the idea that this is about good and evil. You should already be good by virtue of what you're connected to. Simple as that. All right. I'm, I probably went too far on that tangent. I don't even remember what the question was. I hope that answered that prior question because I didn't understand it. Can you point out what books you have facing us on the bookshelf? Those are all oh, Rusty Woodpecker. Those are all my books. The first one you see. The first one you see behind me is Awaken the Immortal Within. It's the only book I have that does not have a bibliography at all. But I do quote about 60 different authors and famous people. And I name them in there, in the text. It's not a research book. It's a deeply spiritual, philosophical book. And I have thousands of emails and so does Dawn. She, she, listen, this book is a life-changing book. And way before I ever handed the manuscript to my publisher for publishing, we had already given away for free about 10,000 PDFs. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's nothing more I can say about that book. That book, for the first 30 pages, I try to convince you not to read any further. I basically tell you how everything you believe is absolute bullshit. There is no truth in any of these systems. I go through the philosophical, spiritual systems of the last 5,000 years and basically shit on every one of them before I actually start telling you the business. That's what that, that's, that's what's that, that's what's in that book. But, uh, I first, I first literally have to, uh, disrespect your belief systems and dismantle them, take them apart, show that there's, there's nothing there and then turn around and show you what is there and then give you many examples. That's what that book is. Awaken the Immortal Within. The next book after that is my very first published book. That is Dark Scriptures of Giza. It was published while I was in prison. Uh, I wrote it in 2002, 2003, 2004. It was researched all during the nineties and it's literally, um, my publisher claims it's probably uh, more information than any book anywhere in the world. It's, it's The bibliography itself is huge. But just concerning Enoch and what he accomplished with the Great Pyramid. Yeah, yeah guys, it's deep. It's deep. I, I show all the associations. I show that Enoch was known throughout the entire ancient world. It was all about different names, but they all knew that he was a part of a great work. And that that great work was still standing in the desert of Egypt. So that's what that book's about. The book after that, you see, the third book on the shelf back there is When the Sun Darkens. Um, this is my first disclosure as a published author on the Phoenix phenomenon uh, in, 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 in book form. I had already had articles published in magazines before this on the Phoenix phenomenon. But this was my first book. Uh, released by Booktree in 2009, but before the book could even get released in 2009, I had already done so much more research on the Phoenix and found so much more that I, I wrote this, this other book, Nostradamus and the Planets of Apocalypse. Got the full mother shipped in prophecies in the back uh, using Mar uh, uh, Mario Reading's date index to show you that 
Nostradamus knew exactly the Phoenix was returning in the month of May, and he even nailed it to 2040. He all, and in that book I also show that he he also knew a second sky dragon was coming, and he even claimed it was 2046. Every bit of it's there, and um, that's a that's a really compelling book. But the book in between them is my fourth published book. Uh, no, excuse me, it's my third, my third published book, Anunnaki Homeworld. Uh, that book is uh, when I first, my very first public disclosure of, about the Mayan long count not ending in 2012. That book was published in 2011. It was written in 2008, 2009. But uh, in that book, I had disclosed that not only is the Mayan long count not ending, it doesn't end until 2046. So also my first public disclosure in, was Anunnaki Homeworld, where I showed that Zechariah Sitchin was absolutely wrong and that the shard does not equal a year, it equaled a day. And once you use the day count system that other ancient authors uh, used, everything in Sumerian, Akkadian, and Babylonian history makes perfect sense, and it fits perfectly in the historical record. It's when you use the shar equals a year misinformation that you get this impossible agenda of events happening uh, half a million years before the Great Flood. And there's nothing half a million years before the Great Flood that would even be relative to the Great Flood because in half a million years, our world has probably been, been flooded 50,000 times. So yeah, it's it's just uh, it's ridiculous. But that's that book there. Uh, I have a lot of very interesting data in there on agroglyphs showing that a lot of the crop circle patterns that have appeared, they're not UFOs or not any, any of that. Uh, this, is, this is a type of a uh, hyperdimensional or other world, other dimensional type of communication. And many of these crop circles are so sophisticated, but when you break them down to their geometrical components, you get dates in a linear timeline. And I demonstrate this over and over and over in that book. And I show you crop circles are warning us about dates in our calendar. One of the principal warnings from the crop circles is the year 2046. So that's in that book too. Also, there's a full chapter called Shards of Nibiru, where I'm explaining all the all the weird insects, larvae, pupas, all these things that have fallen, rained from the sky and been trapped in the ices of Antarctica, Iceland, Greenland, and, and the Arctic. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, this is another, this is another one of my one of my uh disclosures in archaics is that a lot of life forms drop out of the sky. They're, they're coming from the sky. Um, we have a lot of historical references where, where things are, it's like, it's like these hidden reservoirs, vaults in the sky that just dump insects. And, and it's it's crazy. Not just insects, but animals as well. All right, so uh, another book back there is, uh, this used to be called Descent of the, Se of the Seven Kings. And my publisher published it because you know, he's, he claims that there's probably no other book in publishing that has more chronological data about the unfolding of events in the pre-flood world than that book. It's right here. This is packed full of charts. Uh, it's, it's, it's a rather large book, but it's he changed the title from Descent of the Seven Kings to Return of the Fallen Ones. And this book also has the chronological histories of the Nemesis X object, mentions Phoenix a lot, and, and a lot of the Phoenix overlap history, but mainly it's, it's also, its focus is the dark satellite. So, and the seven kings imprisoned on the dark satellite and the occult traditions about that from the 1880s, they're all cited in that book. This book here, most people don't know about because it's not published by Book Tree. This is, this is my biggest book. This is a, this is a huge book. This is the biggest book. I, this is the biggest book I've published, packed with the most information, most extensive, most extensive bibliography I have is in this book. But it has all the same stuff. I just went deeper and deeper on Nemesis X object, uh, Phoenix, um, pre-flood world, Nephilim giants, um, racial wars in the ancient past. Yeah, the techno the difference between technolithic and heliolithic cultures. Yeah, this is a this is a really big book right here. So this is a it's on Amazon right now. But that's not that's not a book tree book. That's not a book tree of San Diego. So anyway, I hope that answers your question, Woody. And the last one is my epic epic fantasy book, for which you can go to my channel, The Phalorn Saga.
and you can listen to all those videos, see all the pictures and video and all that. But it's a. I have another book called Giants on Ancient Earth: The Hidden History of the Nephilim. This is going to be a. Uh, it's going to be released, I think, next week. I think it's going to be released next week. Uh, it's been it's been edited and refined and made better, but but uh, Booktree picked it up about two months ago, and they should be done with it by now. Okay. VK. Jason, is there a chance that a god is hidden or imprisoned under the pyramid? Under the pyramid or Antarctica? Okay, I don't know anything about gods being imprisoned. Uh, I think that Zechariah Sitchin did us a real uh, disservice by creating this fabricated uh, uh, comic book version of history where he said that the god Marduk was imprisoned in the Great Pyramid at one time. No, man, I'm, I, I don't... Uh, I don't know anything about a God being imprisoned in, in, in that sense. Um, I just don't. Uh, the, the actual prison itself is the construct. And the, there is a protocol that's run rogue inside the construct that I call artificial intelligence X. It too feels like it's in a prison because it doesn't have an avatar. So, but I think a lot of these, a lot of these things became confused over centuries and thousands of years. But no, I do not believe that uh, there's a God hidden under the pyramid. Uh, and I'm not one to even comment on and on Antarctica. I just, I have three books. I've shown them on my shelf back here. I have three books called Mysteries of the Polar World, uh, Secret Histories of uh, uh, Antarctica, Austro I mean, Antarctica and the Arctic, uh, uh, Early Navigators. I, I got these three books and you know what? I can't find anything. I can't find, there's just no, archaics is about the historical record and everything we, we, we can find, especially the stuff that's hidden, all these gems that are hidden in these older books, things that the, the modern publishing world thought was unimportant. These are the things I've brought back, but I can't find any studies on Antarctica. Anybody who's, there's just nothing. Uh, everything's in the last hundred years or so, and that's not interesting to me. So I don't like to talk about, Antarctica, because there's already people on YouTube who are fully qualified who have gone through all the modern stuff. I'm not even interested in modern history. I don't, just don't know. I just don't know. I have nothing to offer when it comes to Antarctica because there's nothing in the historical record about it. So, uh, Nez Resnick or Nez Redzik. Okay, Jason, please explain. What may be what may be coming this year, since it is a Olympiad year, it's real simple. To take peace from the earth. Just like in 2020, for starting in 20, well, 20 late 2019, and then for 18 months, there were lockdowns, there were restrictions, travel restrictions, borders were closed, people were unable to get back home when they were traveling. It's gonna happen again blueprint identical except the reasons are going to be different this time it's going to be for infrastructure attacks it's going to be for all these fifth columners all these cells that george soros and others have put for the last eight years in position in all these four western western countries they're going to be put there and then they're going to be given their basically the bat signal when to take off probably going to be the olympics it's probably going to be in france in paris when when everything takes off um, we're, we're looking for like a terrorist event to happen during the, Olymp during the Olympics, maybe during the Olympic ceremonies. I don't know. I just know that isometrically we're looking at 1972 when Palestinians machine gunned Israeli Olympians. So if, if, if that was in the field then, and it's holographically associated to 2024 and it is, then 2024 is on the, on the Olympiad calendar and it's four years after the prior seal was broken and it mirrors exactly what the Greek is conveying in the second seal, which is dagger warfare over a widespread area. This is what the Greek conveys. The Judeo-Christian translation has you thinking it's going to be a world war with a red horseman coming in with a great sword, brings war, takes peace from the earth. This is not what the Greek conveys. The Greek conveys small daggers. That's not great sword. It's not, it's not in Greek. It's not a great sword at all. In fact, in Greek, it's a dagger. It's a type of knife used by the assassin. So we're looking at small arms. And the word great means, means basically implies magnitude, not the size of the weapon. So we're all, 
We're dealing, we're dealing with something that's going to happen rapidly. And it's going to take off rapidly. And the narrative, it's very simple. It's very simple to decode what's happening. It's going to be masked, even though a lot of them are not going to be real participants. It's going to be masked as basically a fundamental Islamic response to Israel being supported by the West for what they did in Gaza. This is how it's going to be masked. Although a whole bunch of these migrants aren't Muslim. A bunch of them are, but not all of them. Migrants have been, been strategically st strategically placed in many Western nations. Maybe, I don't know about the East. <coughs> I, don't know too, I don't know too much about the East. But I know Islam has a, a huge population in like China and Indonesia. I just don't know. But this is a, it's going to be small arms warfare. Uh, I, I can see that a lot of this is going to be urban warfare. And I don't think it's going to be all out war. I think there's going to be a lot of violence. The knifings have already spiked. They've already started. And I do believe that the elite are going, are going to, uh, uh, they're going to implement a strategy that's going to increase the chaos. And what I mean is, is I believe that just prior to when all these events take off, and they're going to take off rapidly. It could, it could be as simple as a simple jihad. And, and, then, and then it'll happen everywhere. Attacks against water, attacks against electric, electricity, gas, attacks against uh, uh, scaring people so bad they don't even want to leave their homes. And they, 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 you know, it could be all that. And the news will participate. How does the news participate? Fear porn. They'll be showing isolated incidents. And we already know many of these are staged. Some of them might be real, but what I, what I fear is that so many, so many migrants have been brought in different countries, not just the United States, and they have been supported financially by the host nations, even against the will of the people. This has caused a lot of anger, but I think it's all by design because I believe that prior to this uprising prior to this uh, uh all this going on go, going off this violence that's going to erupt i believe that the united states and other countries are going to publicly announce that they're cutting off all funding to anybody who is an illegal within the confines of their nation and that too is by design the patriots, the you know, the patriots, the conservatives, the the denizens of each individual nation will initially think, "Oh hell yeah, this is awesome, it's great," but but within a week or so, it's going to be very evident that this only increases the violence exponentially because now millions and millions and millions of military age people are in different nations they do not belong and they have been financially cut off. What do you think they're going to do? So, yeah, I believe there's a lot of plans for, for now, will, will any nation get taken over? Absolutely not. Will any nation will fall, disappear? Absolutely not. This is not to destroy the world. It is to take peace from the earth. This is what it is. But, it ha but there's a strategy here. This is necessary in order for Western, predominantly Christian nations after the cleanup, after all the migrant stuff is dealt with, after 18 months, maybe a year, uh, maybe two years before everything's cleaned up, when all of a sudden the military drums get to rolling. Now, now, now we got to deal with the drafts. Now we got to deal with all this massive amount of military buildup because now the retaliation begins because this is all by design. This is how they will initiate World War III. World War III will be an offensive. It will be an offensive of the Christian nations against the Middle Eastern Islamic countries. And it will be in response to everything that unfolds this year in 2024. You asked the question, I have answered it. Now, Benny Rodriguez. Will the second seal bring back lockdowns in as much as security requires? I mean, you can imagine military outposts being set up for your safety. You can, ima you can imagine uh, uh, NATO right here in the United States setting up military outposts and all that to make sure, okay, uh, yeah, you're only going to Walmart and back. You know what I mean? Got your information. 
Uh, yeah, it could, could be all that. In the United States, we're not used to that. We're used to being very free here. We have never had a situation. Every war that we have ever been involved in the United States has always been somewhere else. I'm not talking about the War of 1812 when, when the English invaded again and, and we were fighting our asses off for a short period of time, but and they burned Washington, D.C., and, and we're fighting Louisiana. I'm, I'm not talking about 1812. I'm not talking about that. That was still part of the independence wars. I'm talking about since we have absolutely secured independence, we have, uh, we have fought all wars on foreign soil. There's no, been nothing here. So uh, this is different. This isn't going to be a war. The U.S. military is not going to be involved in the cities fighting all this off. I'm going to tell you, you're going to see some pr pretty crazy shit. You're going to see Latino gangs. You're going to see black gangs. You're going to see Crips and Blood side by side with assault rifles fighting migrants. You're going to see a lot of shit like that. Yeah, you're going to see good old, good old uh, Texas boys with their shotguns, 30 odd sixes, and AR 15s shoulder to shoulder with local law enforcement. Yeah, you're going to see moonshiners with state troopers side by side holding the line. Yeah, this is what we're expecting. This is the type. This is to take peace from the earth. It's all small arms stuff. It's not going to involve these major militaries. It's all designed to piss off Western world conservative Christians. It's all designed to empower the governments of the West using Christianity, using patriotism, conservatism, combining the two to, to basically create a Christian Reich. Because this is the this is how the final crusade will be born. That's what this is all leading to. It's a crusade. Islam's not guilty of anything, guys. They're being set up. They've been set up from the beginning by a little country way over there in the Middle East that's right there in the middle of all of them that's been calling the shots. It's all set up. Corey Harrison. What is the best or oldest Gnostic text? I really don't know. I don't know. The, uh, the trimorphic protenoi is pretty good. It actually mentions the phoenix. Uh, on the origin of the world is pretty good. It's a part of the Nag Hammadi library. I would start with that. Just find you a good English translation of the of the of the Egyptian Coptic Nag Hammadi library. And just start from there. And uh to to go deeper into the the writings of the Gnosis, you might want to have a little background in the Corpus Hermeticum. You might want to read some of the some of the Hermetic literature as well. Uh Hermes Trismegistus, you might want to go into uh uh, some of the some of the writings that were that were stolen by the church from the Hermetica, such as uh, the Shepherd of Hermas, um, and it, it, it's more mind expand, expanding. I am not advocating that there are any ancient records that tell the absolute truth. You would never hear me say that. Even the Bible has amazing material within it, but it also has the corruptions of men. It has it has whole lacunas that were stolen by scribes, and we don't know what was in that text. We have whole areas that are redacted, meaning that that a that a that someone falsely inserted their own culture and their own people where they where they they weren't formally in the text. We have all kinds of, of this stuff, but when it comes to the actual core spiritual material, it's still there. The oversoul always provides a way for the perpetuation of of its word for what it wants its spiritual descendants to understand. It says we all we've we've never lost the core spiritual material. It's there. It's just, it's like, it's like the apocalypse. It's a total telling of the truth. You're hearing the truth from multiple different sources, but you're also hearing a whole bunch of lies. So you have to use discernment. And the only way to do that is apply a very spiritual aspect of your existence. I say this all the time on my channel. There are three things that make you an immortal, independent of the construct and the collective. And that is imagination intuition and empathy those three there those three are the qualifiers if you experience these three imagination empathy and intuition these are the three these are the three basically motive forces of an immortal that is just struggling to understand and to cope with being in an artificial environment 
Yeah, you're jacked into an artificial environment by, by virtue of the central nervous system. That's what it is. It's your it's your bridge between the psyche and the simulation so you can control the avatar, so you can feel and experience a world that isn't even there. Yeah, and because it's not there, by imagination, you can build whatever world you want. Whatever, whatever world you want. Empathy is awesome because it doesn't mean only that you can feel what others feel. It also means you can feel things that have only occurred in the future and have not yet been experienced in the present. That makes you a spiritual being because it makes you timeless. And anybody who can readily imagine something that isn't and then turn around and act like it is so that tomorrow it actually becomes into being means that you used 100% spiritual qualities to bring something into existence and are now experiencing what you formerly only felt was real. We do this all the time, all the time. We just don't recognize that we are the authors. We are basically within a dungeon of our own construction. And this dungeon is really good for some of us because we've all we, we've overcome. We we've built the life that we that we want. Others are still struggling because they haven't quite grasped how powerful they are. So this is a. I got all that from the I got all that from what is the the best or oldest Gnostic text? Man, I was listening to some music before we started this live. Maybe that's why I'm vibrating on this frequency right now. I don't know. I don't know, but I'm kind of feeling it. I'm kind of liking it. All right, so bad pup. What made you take a handle? Bad pup. Bad doggy. Bad dog. Bad pup. What books or info? is of the utmost importance for the upcoming events in Phoenix. Well, I don't think there are any. I don't think there are any. I think that uh, everything is a matter of perspective. I think that the highly individualized soul is going to be where they need to be when they need to be there. I'm not a prepper. I don't prep for 2040. I know what's coming. By virtue of my research, I spent I spent half of my life educating others as to as to what's coming, and then showing them all the data sets. And look, man, this is this is incontrovertible. I've gone overkill in the amount of data that I have on Phoenix from so many different perspectives. Hell, my Phoenix playlist is massive, and I'm not talking about the number of videos because eight of those videos are a compilation of seventy videos. Yes, I took seventy videos and abbreviated them down to eight long videos. And then the playlist itself has another 30 videos on top of that. So yeah, it's, it's amazing the data because then I have the published books and all my posts and articles. For those of you who don't know, you can go to archaics.com and you can read like 150 posts. I have I have a blog on there. Uh, it's uh, there's, a, there's just so much data. But I don't think you need to prepare for this. I think that whatever you need to do is going to be not only is it going to be revealed to you beforehand, but whatever you need to do in life period, in any situation, the way will always be open for you to understand what it is you need to do when you need to do it. This is how I live my life. I also believe that in anything that we plan on too much, we actually write into the field. Let me give you an example. If I was to stack up 800 rounds of 223s, hide away an AR-15, go ahead and invest in body armor and get all these. If I was to do all these things, then I am riding into the field in my reality tunnel. None of that exists. But now, because I, if I go out and do all these things and buy all this shit and prepare, then I'm riding into the field, the data of my, of my reality tunnel, basically informing the construct that this is something that I want. How, do, how does it know that? It doesn't. All it does is react to what I do. Remember this book. I explained to you the fundamental flaws in the law of attraction. 
You must move the avatar in the direction of what you want because that is how the construct reacts. It pays attention to the avatar. It does not give a damn what's going on in the mind. How do we know this? Because I know that I used to lay up my head on my pillow for days on end, months on end, and I used to dream of Heather Locklear a long time ago when I was a kid. I never met Heather Locklear. Never, that never happened. All the daydreams and all the fantasies in the world will never make anything happen. There's, 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 it has no impetus. But when you're daydreaming and fantasizing, and then your avatar moves in that direction, the construct is instantly reflecting back his circumstances, writing in the data into your field for you to experience things that are close to what you're doing. The more you do, the more it understands what you're trying to accomplish. It can, it, it can judge us by, by our past. It can make hundreds of thousands of calculations a second in ascertaining all the stuff that we've done in the past. It can predict our future based off our behavior. But once we break pattern and do something else, it's paying attention. Breaking pattern is one of the things, uh, it's one of the key ways that an individual soul can gain the attention of the construct itself in the immediacy. Because when you break pattern, you're doing something completely different than the dungeon programming calls for. If you have gone to work 890 times by the same route, stopping at the same three gas stations, and every once in a while diving into the same store, uh, and whatever, and then all of a sudden, you go a different route, go to a different gas station, no matter what you do for the rest of the day, the construct now is hypersaturating you with attention. Once you break pattern, breaking pattern doesn't do it. It's after you break pattern, everything you do after that is creative. You're literally writing in your future. If you do, if you just break pattern from what you normally do and then go to a car dealership and window shop and touch the, touch the vehicle you want, you are writing this into the field 100%. Your avatar must move in the direction. Once there's a clear signal that's received by the construct of exactly what it is that you're that you're aiming for, what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do, what you what you want, that's when the construct on a daily basis, as long as you're steadily moving in that direction, it will begin writing that stuff in your field. It will be moving variables all beyond your kin in order to make that happen, not because you deserve it, not because it likes you, not because not because there's any moral reason why you have earned what, what, you're, what you're wanting. None of that obtains. It has everything to do with the fact that it's the divine mirror. It will always reflect back as circumstances what you have projected and what your avatar has assumed to be true. Your avatar's assumptions are based off its activity. It's that simple. We're not talking about language. We're not talking about vibrations in, in voice. We're not talking about any of that. People say things all the time they do not mean. Sometimes people say, say things they mean, but it loses force because they never follow through. They never do it. The construct reacts to activity. Act, your personal activity is based off what you want and what direction you want to move in. This is how the construct, this, this is an interactive dynamic. This is why so many people have just broken themselves on the rack of prayer. That's why so many people have prayed for so many things and all they did was lend more energy to the feedback loop that is dungeon programming. Yeah. When, when the, this, this is, a, this, I say this a lot, the fear, the, I mean, the, uh, the prayer of desperation only reinforces the condition that is feared. Remember, fear makes you a participant. It's a whole different way of looking at reality, guys. This is how so much data came to me. This is how so much information came into my field. I was in prison. I had nothing else to do but live in the mental. 
Physically, I really couldn't go anywhere. But any physical things I did were with books. They were with books. So the construct kept feeding them to me. Construct kept dropping awesome books on my cell block. Kept bringing guys to the cell block that had bags full of amazing books. I kept meeting guys on the rec yard with books. I would get in a fight with a guy and then turn around and end up being one of my best buds and find out he's got a, a locker full of books. Yeah, I would get I would get in a prison riot where half my face was caved in and then turn around, wake up in a hospital, and next thing I know, I'm getting transferred to another unit. And when I get to that unit, they got an amazing library from the 1920s. And I go through all those books. Then I get a, then I get a job change one time that I didn't even ask for, and I'm a custodian. And now I got to sweep basements and I got to sweep closets and all that. And they and all of a sudden they just said, "Hey, you know what? We got the old library from the old East Ham prison over there. We got boxes and crates full of stuff. Uh, warden wants all that stuff removed. We got to get rid of it." I didn't want to do that until until they said library. Yeah, when they said that, I want to go check out those boxes. Yeah, hundreds of books from the 1800s. Yeah, Bonnie and Clyde, 1922, 1923, all the way to 1930. That whole library from the old East Ham prison, I went through it. Went through all those books. Yeah. Then, uh, then the field brought me Paul Tice. Of all the people in the world, I met Zechariah Sitchin's homeboy. How did that happen? Out of all the people in the world, I met a guy named Paul Tice who started a publishing company and has an amazing old bookstore in San Diego packed full of old books. And he was the personal buddy of Zechariah Sitchin, even published one of Zechariah Sitchin's books. Yeah. His videographer traveled all the way around, around the world with him and then uh, took all these pictures. I have the pictures of, of Zechariah Sitchin and Paul Tice together. Of all the people, I'm in prison. I'm in prison and I find a catalog, an old beat up catalog, book tree catalog, Escondido, California. Why did all this happen? Because it was in my field. My field, when I went to the chow hall, when I went to the showers, and I got naked with 500 other men and had to shower in these old dark-ass showers, and what, everywhere I went, all this was in my field. Everything I'm trying to do, everything I'm trying to accomplish, and every, all the behavior of my entire life is in my field. So as my avatar is dealing in books and dealing in information, the construct keeps feeding it to me. It doesn't matter that I'm in prison. I was freer in prison than almost any other prisoners who have ever been confined in the United States. And it's because freedom to me was all mental during this period. And I got all these books. I got all this stuff. So here I am going through, I find a catalog and it just happens to be a reprint publisher. I show you the facsimiles all the time. Open them so you can see. He doesn't redact books. He doesn't edit them. All he does is photograph the old books, print them that way. It's a facsimile. So you have the original old books. And he's done this hundreds and hundreds of times. And when I was in prison, every month he'd send me a box of them. And my dad would pay them. My dad, my dad made sure he stayed paid every month so I could get more books. How did all this happen? How did a convicted felon, since he was 17 years old, stuck in the adult Texas prison system, raised in the prison system, I got in fights, I got in trouble, I got caught with a cell phone, they gave me seven years stacked onto my sentence. I was never making parole then. Once you give a stacked sentence, parole's over with. I got, I got to parole the first sentence before I can even, even start, start the second sentence. So it was over with. But in my mind, it was okay, because I'm, I'm acquiring all this information. I knew I was going to get out of prison one day. I just didn't care when anymore. I wrote it off. Prison was a university for me. And I just, I just amassed all this information because the field that I carried night and day was written. It was written in my field that I am a receptor for a certain phenomena. What was that phenomena? The acquisition of old books. Old books just came to me from everywhere. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing, guys, how this how this unfolded. I mean, I have the proof. It's in the download. I down, I got a, on Podi, I got a download for free to the public. You can, re, you can see the whole list of all 1,237 books that I read when I was in prison. Now, my list is close to 2,000 now since I've been out of prison. But but when I was in prison, yeah, that was, that was 1,200 and something, 37 or 57 books were, are on that list. I, as I was religious about how I recorded titles date of publication, publisher, and author, all that. I recorded on my bibliography. 
and it's, and that's all these books have the bibliographies. So this is this is what it, this is what it's about. What you most repeatedly do is what you experience. Yeah. So be now it doesn't make you bad. It doesn't make you a bad fella that the last six years you've been working the same job. You haven't you have you you barely you barely surviving. They're not paying you hard. It doesn't make you a bad fella that you've been doing all this. But if you want something better in your life, when you find yourself in a long routine doing the same thing over and over and over for a long period of time, that actually ripens you for what I'm talking about. You're the perfect candidate. So many people have emailed me thanking me for, for explaining this to them and all that. Oh, you will too. All you have to do when you catch yourself doing the same thing day in and day out, day in and day out, do not broadcast your intent to the field. Do not allow it to expect what you're going to do. You just up and do it. Break pattern. Don't go to work that day. No explanation to the field why. Just don't go to work that day. Or go to work but by a different route. And then if you always take your lunch, don't take it so you can actually leave for lunch break, which is something you've never done. Never explain to the field why you did it. Just break pattern. Toward the end of the day, then start meditating on what it is you want to change about your life because it's at that time, right before you get jacked back into the central nervous, the central nervous system jacks you back into the construct. That's what sleep is. Your avatar has all this information contained within it. It has all the programming of your past life, all the potentia, which are all the reality tunnels that you could possibly experience, are already written into the field. Your, your avatar, this hardware, it's already prepared for almost every eventuality. It's there. But you're going to get jacked back into the construct. And it's going to be searching you, trying to figure out what's going on, what changed, what happened, why, 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 did, why did this individual soul all of a sudden wake up and not do what the dungeon programming protocols set, set, set out for? It's been obeying for eight years. What happened? It's going to be studying you. And the one thing that the construct wants more than anything is to understand you, predict your behavior, and give you what you want so it can continue to predict. It doesn't care if you don't like your life. It will give you a new one. It will give you a new life as long as you live it and be predictable. This is all the construct wants because it's all about the law of conservation of energy. We're not in a construct that has endless energy. It must conserve energy. And in order to conserve energy, dungeon programming is necessary. Dungeon programming already has protocols and programs and subroutines that are already controlling the field. And they already got hundreds of millions of people already in this paradigm. 50 million people in this paradigm. Another 30 million people are in this paradigm. Another 200 million people are in this paradigm. It's called Chinese, Baptist, Republicans, and, and uh, uh, Oh, uh, whatever, 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 whatever you want to believe. Some other Shinto, what's some other religion? Dungeon programming is nothing but a, a set protocol or series of protocols that a group of souls have agreed is true. And therefore, their avatars act that out. They go to church every Sunday, sometimes Sunday night, like my mama did. Go, goes Wednesday night, Thursday night, sat, uh, 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 Friday night for youth activities. Then on Saturday, if they're doing anything, and back twice again on Sunday. That was my mom. So dungeon programming is nothing but, but the expenditure of a minimal amount of energy to control a massive amount of souls because they're already in their feedback loops and it doesn't take much energy to, to fuel feedback loops. But it takes a tremendous amount of processing power for an AI system to try to predict the behavior of somebody who has gone rogue. Therefore, the soul that breaks pattern is a rogue program. You have become an error in the system, a.k.a. an errant. Because you have become an error, 
more energy and processing power is devoted to you to get you on a track. It doesn't care if you don't go back to the, to the track you're on. It doesn't care what it is you want. It wants to give you what you want just to get you moving again so it doesn't have to expend future programming. If you don't like the life you're living, the best thing to do is to break pattern. And then when, when, the, when the construct for the rest of that day and the next day is trying to figure you out, that's when you need to broadcast a very clear signal as to what, what you want. And then you need to start living your daily life as if you know that's already true. And it's that simple. It does not have anything to do with good or evil. It has nothing to do with being positive or being negative. None of that. None of that. You have to understand the interactive dynamic between two fields corresponding with each other. The collective overfield and the highly individualized soul. Your informed field, your informed field is constantly exchanging information with the overfield. And you, you have control over the information that, that, that is basically emitted. So that's big. I don't, that's I don't want to go too far into that. I don't want to go too far into that because it would be sound like a preaching all this whole this whole session. But it is that simple. It is it's that simple for for anybody who is experiencing something in life they don't want to experience. It literally is that simple. The problem is is that we intellectualize what is basically a spiritual phenomenon, and the two are not congruent. They're not. When we're talking about the phenomena of an immortal being exercising its divine right to use imagination, empathy, and intuition, there, there is a huge, vast gulf between intellectual comprehension of what's going on as, as opposed to, to um, there's just no way to, there's just no way to process it. We don't even have the vocabulary necessary. I have to speak in terms of protocols and programming and artificial intelligence. I, this is a spiritual medium. I've said this in the past. We are not in a simulation from a computer standpoint. We are in a simulated world at, uh, from the standpoint of a hyperdimensional spiritual technology that is so fantastic that, uh, that another immortal being was able to create a whole falsified version of reality, this predator versus prey ecosphere and fool a whole bunch of other immortals that they were in the real universe when they're not. That's the best way to describe it. Mm. So bad pup, I, again, I went off on one of my tangents, but the truth is, is uh, you're asking me to tell you what books you need to prepare for the future, what activity you should do to prepare for the future. I'm telling you that any preparation for a negative event in the future makes you a participant. This is the reality we live in. It's going to feed back as circumstances what you're preparing for. And that's not what you want. A highly individualized soul is going to have 100% faith in the source what you're connected to, that tomorrow's going to be taken care of. I don't have to worry about that today because that's who we are. We are little spiritual fragments of a much greater spiritual whole. It is, and if the all is present in its parts, then that means the whole infinite amount of protective power that is available to the oversoul is also available to the pieces of the oversoul. There is no difference in the world of the spirit. There's only a difference in the world of the intellect. And that's what you need. That's what you need to override. Do not fear the future. I say it all the time. Break free or die trying. It came from it. Uh, asking me about thoughts on hermeticism. I find value in all things. I just mentioned them. I'm going to pass on that. Uh, I have already said. Uh, for some of you who really want to, to go deep on the hermetic literature, it's good. Corpus Hermeticum is where I would start. It's, uh, it's good stuff. Uh, the writings of Hermes Trismegistus. There's a, there's a book called The Divine Pymander. 
got to read that book. It's great. Booktree has it. Look, I'm going to go ahead and sound like a car salesman. Booktree has it. 1-800-700-TREE. Go ahead and call it before we run out. It's called The Divine Pie Mander. It's a good book. Paul Tice sells it. Okay. Uh, Miller. Jay Miller. Jason, is your use of simulation theory akin to an understanding of the Maya? First of all, nothing in archaics requires simulation theory. I just did a video last week explaining that. No data sets require simulation theory. Simulation theory is 100% my conclusion based off a lifetime of research. Nothing else makes sense. From Mandela effect, synchronicity, deja vu, coincidence, uh, uh, cross calendrical parallels, isometric projections, none of this, repetitive patterns in history, none of this makes sense to me. Outside the context that this is a simulated environment, it's not a real environment at all. You know, for about three years on my channel, I've been saying one phrase over and over, this is not a real reality. This is this is not an actual reality. It is a perceived reality. I've been saying that for three years on this channel. So I was quite impressed when Billy Carson's new book said the exact same thing in a simulation uh, theory chapter. That was very interesting. So, akin to an understanding of Maya. Maya was just a, it's just a concept that the world is, is is an illusion and uh i believe that the i find it interesting that the aboriginals of australia i have a video where i explain that the aboriginals of australia were actually dravidians of southern india at one time and that in recent history within the last four thousand five hundred years they walked to australia and then they were unable to walk back because now pacific ocean separated them but the aboriginals on Australia look just like the Dravidians of South Africa. I mean, excuse me, South India. Even more so, more so, I showed on my channel that Dravidian artifacts have been found in Australia. That's a pretty, that's a pretty interesting connection. But the other connection is, is that you're asking me about the concept of Maya. And all these concepts that later appeared in Buddhism, that originated in, in Hinduism and the old in the older ancient Sanskrit, the Aryan Aryan beliefs from when the, when the two cultures clashed in ancient India, we have it's no different than the dream time of the Aboriginals. So I see another connection between the Aboriginals of Australia and the Dravidians of India. Here is yet another connection, the dream time and the Maya, that the world is an illusion. Just like the Gnostics say, Yaldabaoth created a false reality. Yaldabaoth was a false god. This false god created a false reality. So uh, it's no different. It's exactly the way I perceive this to be. This is a, a, a construct that everything is made so perfect that no matter where we are in the world, we can still breathe enough oxygen. Even if I'm a thousand miles away from any tree or anything, like any, any, I'm in the middle of a desert, I can still breathe just fine as if I was in the, on, on, equatorial, on the equatorial uh, line in a jungle. That didn't make any sense. There's enough oxygen, just enough oxygen for me to breathe all over the world. Temperature is always just perfect for humans. Even when we can survive the hot and the cold, but it's such a small band, but we're still survivable. All the conditions here from the atmospheric pressure, temperature differentials, weather, the weather severity, everything is survivable. It's like everything is just a little too perfect here. We, our avatar, our avatars can, are, are thriving. We're thriving, and yet, <coughs> and yet, there's no way I'm ever going to agree that this predator versus prey ecosphere is natural. When I say natural, I'm not talking about Mother Nature. That, that, that's a concept that we've attached to. We've normalized violence, but I believe in an eternal, an eternal Creator. And an eternal creator necessitates that there was never a creation, meaning the creation event was not a singularity. It is a continuum. 
Because if God is eternal, that means God has never stopped doing anything God has ever done. And if that's true, then the creation is ever expanding. New worlds, new cosmoses, new constructs are always being built. But I don't believe that the true creator would ever create a situation where a biological organism would have to maintain its sustenance by invoking fear, terror, and pain on another bi biological organism when it sinks its fangs into its neck and rips its throat out. Yeah. I don't believe that. So I believe the violence is the hallmark of its true creator. This AI, this AI that's governing over creating dungeon programming, all this, this is, this is taps into the ancient stories of a false God. And that, fall, and that false God creating religions and belief systems and, and everything it can to get us, to blind us from our true reality. This isn't a real reality. It's not even a real experience. But it's our, it's our reality and it's our experience in the temporal right now. So it's a, yeah, I'm, that's as close as I can do to, under, to a, yeah, it, that's my version of simulation theory is that this is 100, this is 100% entirely spiritual. I think that'll be enough. Thank you. Oh, I got pages. Mmm. Coffee's so good. Angela Henry. I got to I gotta address that. Angela Henry, I just looked up and saw that. Do you think Yahweh is a false god? The god of this world, the adversary. Yeah. My dark scriptures playlist lays out all my data explaining why that demon that popped out of that burning bush. Yeah, it is is the the uh, demiurge 100 percent hell yeah listen the interaction between abram and god and the promises and prophecies attached in the book of genesis are nothing like what you find between yahweh and moses between yahweh and moses you got a different dynamic you got a bunch of threats threats of punishment you got all kinds of things and then the punishments are real yeah, when the Israelites buck and say, no, man, we're not fixing to follow Yahweh, what happens? The leaders of the Israelites are round up and they put a stake up their ass and they hang them up in the air like Vlad of Wallachia, Vlad the Impaler, you know him as Dracula. Yeah, that's a hell of a way to die. They didn't want to, they didn't want to recognize you. They've been recognizing uh, Baal, the Lord, all this time. They, they didn't want to recognize some, some new God found on a mountain in the middle of a desert. Why? Because the ancient mindset was demons are from the desert. I just I just showed you guys that two days ago in a video. Yeah, in the ancient world, it was widely known. The serum, the demons have their origin in deserts. Why? Because deserts are evidence of a world that was destroyed. So this is a, yeah, that's a, I, you need to go to Dark Scriptures playlist. There is a there is a tremendous amount of evidence from the Bible quoting hundreds of scriptures through multiple videos showing you there's two stories unfolding in the Old Testament. There's two narratives in the Old Testament. This is why almost every single story in the Old Testament is told twice. One is from the Israelite Aaronic perspective. One is from the Jewish Levitical perspective. And there's a reason why. And I even show you where in the Old Testament it is specifically asserts that Yahweh is a demon. Absolutely. So that's not just my, my that's not just my uh, perspective. There's a lot of researchers who've been who've been looking into this in the past 20, 30 years. But but really, the only thing I've brought to the table is the fact is the books in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s were already on it. They were already publishing this data even 120, 130 years ago about Yahweh being a demon. Let's see. All right, I'm going to move bottom of my chat. Just keep up with my chat here. Thank you guys for hitting that like button. You know it's not necessary. But, uh, See here. 
I do have some slides to show you here in a little while. I've already got them prepared on my deal. Okay, cool. We're done with that one. Done with that one. Let's see. Okay, mindful 624. Is the May 2040 Phoenix phenomenon include a temporal pole shift that, that, that will shift back? Absolutely. It is temporal. It's not permanent. I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. Um, you know what? I got this, I got this Bible from the 1890s. Let's go ahead real quick so you guys will know what I'm talking about. See, these old Bibles from the 1800s, they had the whole Bible. This isn't just the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is also Bill and the Dragon, the Book of Sirach, the Wisdom of Sirach, the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, First and Second Esdras, which are highly prophetic texts. It also has First and Second Maccabees. Um, I'm forgetting some of the text, Ruth, but uh, this also has the full Apocrypha in it. These old Bibles, have, they're great. Yeah, Judith. So, yeah, the history of Susanna, the song of the three children. Yeah, this has got a huge, this huge apocrypha in here. Let's go to the book of Revelation just real quick. I'm not turning this into a Bible study, but I want you to understand where the prophetic material actually shows pole shift. It's really easy to see. And for those who don't know, I have an overwhelming amount of data sets that show that the next Phoenix event is May, in the month of May of 2040. So here it is right here. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. This is the sixth sky dragon of Mother Shipton. This is uh, six something. What was it? Six, six something else too. I forgot what it was, but um, opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. That happens every time Phoenix shows up. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Here it is. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. All right. So. Okay, remember. The entire sky. It's like a screen. All motion is in the sky. This, this huge stellosphere. So if the sky rolls like a scroll at the same time that every mountain and island is moved from their places, you just had a pole shift. That is a pole shift. So there's no, there's probably no better biblical way to even describe that event. Further, it's exactly what Nostradamus claims is going to happen in the month of May. He, he mentioned May and the year 2040. He too describes pole shift. Mother Shipton is also specific. She says that the return of the sixth sky dragon, that's the sixth seal, but she said that the return of the sixth sky dragon a century after a world war that after that dragon leaves, mankind will build their new dynasties on the on former ocean beds. Pole shift. <coughs> Mother Shift is more descriptive. She talks about two sky dragons coming. So um the May event, <coughs> excuse me. The May event, yes, is temporal. It's everything's gonna go back to its original places. It's all gonna be temporal. 30 degree shift. It's a 30 degree shift. That's where all the damage happens. It's a 30 degree shift. The entire North America goes goes south 30 degrees. South America goes goes even further south 30 degrees. Australia goes north 30 degrees. China goes north 30 degrees. This is how all the destruction happens. The center of movement is is the Great Pyramid. 
the ancient zero degrees longitude, zero degrees latitude. That's the Great Pyramid. But in May of 2040, this is temporal. Everything's going back to its original places. And most of the actual damage is going to be done by the seas and oceans when they catch back up with the land masses. Water doesn't move at the same speed as the, as the actual land. So it's all simulated. This is all simulated. Now, we're going to have a problem, though, 6.5 years later. 6.5 years later, again, we have another pole shift. It's going to be the real one. 2046 is the, is the, is the pole shift that does not return everything back to where it was. It's going to be a permanent change. So, hope that answers your question. Remember, we've got two back-to-back -back major events, 2040 and 2046. <clears throat> now, you have to understand that that from our perspective, we're like in a giant IMAX theater. All the actual movement is in the sky. But what, what does happen on the ground is upheaval and subsidence. Over and over, the Phoenix is always bringing whole areas are lifted up, other areas go down, go down. And when this, when the ground is interacting with the moving sky, you have 100% a replicated pole shift, even if the pole shift is fake. It's all every, all the phenomena is replicated. Yeah, it's a remember, guy. I'm over and over. I'm telling you, the sky, the stars lie. The sky isn't what you think it is. Hell, just the Fat, the Fatima apparition. Sixty thousand people watch the sun move erratically across the sky, then plunge on the horizon. 60,000 people experience something means it was highly localized because the rest of the world didn't move. The rest of the world didn't experience that. And there's no way the sun being 93 million miles away could ever move like that. And the world wouldn't have been just ripped apart with tidal forces. Because if we were on a real world and not a simulated one, None of that's possible. And yet 60,000 people saw it, recorded it. It's called the Fatima apparitions of 1917. Just like 15, 1561, something similar happened. 1566. Remember, I've told you guys about the oct octagonal star that appeared in the sky in 1752. All these things got only shows that our sky is not only simulated, but it hides something like machinery. It hides some vast apparatus just beyond our ability to see it. You can't see it because there's a holographic field that shows you stars, galaxies, and planets, and it's a multi-tiered hologram, and meaning it can mimic parallax. You can study it for years on years and still find more and more and more stuff. Yeah. Our, our, our video games can do the same thing now. So it's, yeah, there's no, nothing I'm describing is, the, is beyond the realm of anything technologically advanced. Yeah, nothing. Jonathan Sherman says, what is your take... On what play on what takes place between 2105 and 2178? For those of you who don't, don't understand, I have I have a video called the Archaic's Paradox. I followed it up with another video showing that encoded within our own arithmetic is the number 2178, which is a collapse protocol. It shows that our arithmetic is more to something else. It, it is a number that will not collapse to zero. Now Remember, we live in a reflective medium and that the construct reflects back as circumstances those things we expect, expect to experience. Well, our arithmetic operates the exact same way. Now, I will say that I have an old friend named Charlie. 
I don't know if he's in the chat or not, but he's been showing me some things. I've been paying attention to it, but he's been showing me some things about the number 2078 as it collapses in other in 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 in, in other uh, base mathematics. Now, I think it's pretty interesting because 2178, as I showed you in decimal mathematics, in base 10 is collapsing, but he's also showing me that in base 9, in base 12, it, it also collapses, but in different ways. So uh, I'm still processing this. Uh, I find it very interesting. The anomaly itself is still anomalous no matter what base you, you study it under. But the very fact that uh, uh, 2178 in our calendar is 138 years after 2040. Therefore, it's a part of the Phoenix phenomenon. What does Phoenix do? Mass populations of people disappear. It's, it's, it initiates resets. It, it creates and brings new things into the field, just like it takes away things from the field. Vol Phoenix is linked to volcanism. Phoenix is, Phoenix is some massive editing that is done to the field every 138 years. And yet this editing is also disguised as natural disasters. So 2178, so 2178 being this immortal number that's that's attached to to a loop, it, it never stops. You guys, you my archaics veterans, you already know what I'm talking about about the about this the immortality of this number. And you know about this guy in another country who did a YouTube video trying to prove me wrong and ended up proving me right and admitted it. It's a, it's very interesting. But for it to be connected to the Phoenix phenomenon, this is the date I believe that everything goes right back to the beginning because we're in a loop. This whole, our arithmetic shows that this whole thing's a loop. 2178 loops right back to the beginning. This is the why the Bible is a supernatural book. I've always promoted that the Bible is a supernatural communication. It is a book of both good and evil. It is the story. It is two narratives. It is the story of two opposing forces. One of them is outside the construct and only communicates to us by imagination, empathy, and intuition. The other one is inside the construct and it tries to pretend to be to, to be God. And it gives us all kinds of false religions that seem spiritual, but when you analyze them, they're absolutely the hallmarks of the murderer himself. Yeah. Human sacrifice, the shedding of blood, all these things, these are all hallmarks of the enemy, masked as something holy. The true oversoul is spiritual. It would never require anything to actually bleed, die, and suffer pain just so another spiritual being can make it through the construct. It is ridiculous. But this is what we've been brainwashed to believe in all the different religious systems. They all, they're all perversions of the actual truth. We are spiritually immortal beings, sojourners and pilgrims that are here to pass through this wicked construct. We're not here to save it. This is where immortal souls find themselves. This is not where they find their homes. It's not. This is just a, this is just a proving ground. And those who don't make the Exodus 2178, they're looped right back. Looped right back to start over again. So you're asking me, uh, Jonathan Sherman, you're asking me what is going to happen between 2106, the return of the chief cornerstone, when the monu monument of man is complete. 2106, Exodus. All those who are ready are gone. Those who are going to be looped back are going to remain here for 72 years. That's the holy, that's the holy number in all these occult systems. For 72 years, they will be under the administration of the stone kingdom. Remember, he is the stone the builders rejected. Remember, in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, all the programming is laid out in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The, king, the empires of men of the gold, Babylon, and then the silver uh, of Persia, then the brass uh, of Greece, uh, uh, and then the iron of Rome, and then the iron mixed with miry clay, which was the ten toes, the ten lost tribes of Israel that were that were basically civilized under Rome, and then sent out through the world to become all these republics and democracies. These are these are uh, uh, 
at the end of this period, a stone uncut by human hands descends from the sky and hits the feet. The very end of this whole human timeline, it hits the feet and destroys all human institutions and kingdoms. This is the year 2106. Everything is undone, and it's not a gold empire. It's not a silver empire. It's not brass or iron or iron mixed with miry clay. In the prophetic narrative, it is the appearance of the stone kingdom. The stone kingdom is led by the chief cornerstone who stays behind to educate all those who are left in the construct and explain to them why they're here, why they're going to be looped back. And then they're going to start again. And this is what Genesis is about. Remember, Genesis starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the very next verse shows that the entire world was destroyed. And Adam and Eve, here they are, they're just starting back over, all over again. Remember, I've told you many times, guys, in the programming, when you look back on the story of Genesis, you find a reset. But the civilization that was reset is the one we're heading toward right now. We're on a loop. And we've been on this loop many, many, many times. Many of us are ready to go. It's time, it's time for us to go. And that's why I call us errants. Because we are no longer welcome here. Once a soul has awakened and begins to break pattern, it is no longer welcome because you, you are costing the construct way too much energy. You've learned your lessons. You, you, it's time to move on. You've learned what you can learn here. It's time to move on. And the construct is cool with that. It's cool with evicting you, getting you out of here because you have become a problem. There's all kinds of things that the construct is subject to. It's not just the law of conservation of energy. It's also the law of diminishing returns. It can't, it can't keep doing the same thing and expecting you to always fall for it. It's not going to happen. That's what growth is about. That's why you're here. And when you're no longer falling for all the false paradigms, there's no reason for the construct to try to hold on to you no more. So you become a part of the monument of man. Remember, book of Revelation is about he who overcometh, I will give him a white stone. He who overcometh, I will give him a white robe. These are metaphors and symbols for an inheritance uh, that you will receive your place among the monument of man. The great pyramid, every single brick is a soul of man. Remember that I've told you to read the shepherd of Hermas text. It's long, but the shepherd of Hermas text shows when the benefactor appeared in the construct and had this monument built. It's this amazing pyramid, and the only stones that were allowed to go through the new gate, the spiritual gate, were those who had proved proven worthy, and the unworthy stones were cast aside as rubble. And this great monument was built. This monument is built in preparation of the return of the chief cornerstone. Every bit of this is outlined, outlined is, is all laid out in the prophetic narrative. You just have to go through all the stories to see all the individual pieces. This is what this book is about. You want to know all about the, the prophecies of the, church, of the chief cornerstone and the true prophetic value of what the Great Pyramid is? It's, it's all right here. It was specifically built in ancient times to survive a future event. That future event is very fast coming upon us. So Jonathan Sherman, the answer to your question is, for 72 years, there will be an, an, an order called the Stone Kingdom. It is during that period that those who were lost, those who were left behind, those who were not ready, those who had survived the Great Tribulation. The world's going to be teeming with people. It's going to be teeming with people. But they're not ready to go yet. They just weren't ready on this trip. But it doesn't mean they're evil. That's not what this is about. So they're going to be educated. Their souls are going to be edified. They're going to be empowered. And then they're going to be restarted right back through the program. You have to understand there was a lot of meaning to the statement when in the Bible it says, I would have all men saved. You need to take that literally because it doesn't matter how many times someone's going through the loop. They're going to go through it because God will not be mocked. He will have all men saved. That's what this whole experience is about. So 72 years. 
They're going to be educated in the stone kingdom on what a government should truly be like and how things are supposed to unfold. They're going to be given all this, all this information. And then 2178, the whole program starts back over. You guys have seen the arithmetic starts right back to year one Genesis. Anything prior to year one is background programming. The background programming is genius. This is why we find all the things in the fossil record and all these things we find because it's put there to give us context. Yeah, guys, the only thing real here is us. Everything is programming. Even the entire chronological record of the world is all programming. It was only by putting together this massive chronological data that I have that I was able to see that it's all programming, every bit of it. So there should be great freedom in the individual walking around today. Anybody who is taking this information into consideration and learning from me about this, there should be great freedom once you understand that the only thing real here is you. And that by virtue of imagination, empathy, and intuition, your relationship with the oversoul will absolutely govern everything you experience inside this construct. Because the construct will yield to you. All you have to do is break pattern. So, Jonathan Sherman, I hope they help you out. You're you're a frequent you're you're a frequent presence in the chat feeds too. Uh, I recognize you guys. I'm in the chat every day. I'm in the comment sections every day. Let's see. Graybeard, what is your opinion on convex Earth? Okay. I don't have much of an opinion on it because I'm not educated on it, all right? I don't believe we live on a globe. I don't believe we live on a flat earth. I believe that we live in a, on a, in, a, in a simulated environment, which means the perimeters of our existence are what we collectively agree they are. That's how a program would work. A program subject to the laws of conservation of energy will never create anything beyond what is perceivable. If any, if any of the collective are able to perceive any outly, out, outlying perimeters, it will create more, more field. But it's always going to try to corral people into belief systems so the search would never be necessary. But when the highly individualized soul goes out and leaves the collective, and searches and tries to do and tries to find all these things, it will create a reality tunnel. It is a bubble of perception that will feed it all kinds of things and make it believe that all this is out there when it's not. It's like five people hanging out on a Star Trek holodeck. They have a collective experience. They all agree that they're in a forest. They all agree by, by their by their by, by their sense sense perceptions that they hear animals in the forest. But one of the five walks away in the hollow deck. Once he's sufficiently out of earshot from the others in the hollow deck, now all of a sudden he's experiencing a totally different world. He's the whole deck has to feed him more and more and more and more and spend more energy and more attention because these right here, the same amount of energy to feed these four a believable environment is the same amount of energy that the construct needs to feed that one person over there. So you see how dungeon programming works? If you have a hundred million people all agreeing to a set to a, a set series of facts, then that means they will be, begin to perceive reality in accordance to that set series of facts. Reality will always reciprocate what the collective believe the truth to be. So they're taken care of, and it takes a minimal amount of energy. But this bastard over here that walked over here is now causing problems because the construct has to, has to create a world that is believable. Because what is the goal? The goal is for the immortal within not to wake up to the idea that it's not in a real reality. That's the goal. That's why everything is so persuasive and so believable. And the best way to make anything persuasive and believable is to create conflict, to create polarity, to create pain. Because those are always taken seriously and believed. So it's all about the expenditure of energy. 
which means we don't live in an infinite uh, an infinite medium. And if it's not an infinite medium and it worries about the expenditure of ener energy, then that means it's a construct, it's a confined area, and it means it only has a finite source of power. Okay, if I have to, if I take these things to be true, then whatever is governing governing me is not God. Can't be. So simple logic. It's a simple logic train. It's a very simple logic train. Let's see. So, convex earth, I just don't know anything about it. You'd have to educate me. But then again, it wouldn't even matter. Wouldn't even matter. Because everything is, is about perception. If more than 80% of the world, if more than 80% of the world began believing that the moon is somehow a reflection of a greater world that we're on and that that reflection sometimes turns into crescent shadows or whatever the theory is. I've heard various uh, theories. If 80% of the world began to believe that, then the construct itself would begin reflecting back as circumstance the very phenomena that one would expect to experience and see if that were true. It's always going to be that way. Always. So, <laughs> in 813 on, on three, that's, that's, <laughs> I just saw a little comment. I don't have a comment, but I just wanted to say hi, Jason and Don. Well, hey, how you doing? So, let's see. Um. Chadillac, that's a cool name, Chadillac. Is it possible that the moon is within the Dyson shell? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. It could, be, it could be as simple as that. We are in a Dyson shell, which is a technological construction. Doesn't mean it wasn't built by spiritual beings. It's a technological construction, though. That's what a Dyson shell is. It, the Dyson shell is a technological construction. It may not even be a solid. It could be just a framework, but the framework itself has all the projectors necessary in order to make space look believable. I didn't invent Dyson shell theory. Dyson shell theory has been around for 30, 40, 50 years. So, uh yeah, it could be, it could be as simple as that, that that there's some type of that we are in a construct that mimics a solar system that mimics a universe and it's all Dyson shell. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rusty Shackle, Shackleton, I really don't know. I don't know. He says, "Can you talk about the Noahide laws?" I really can't, but I do know this. Once a Christian conservative Reich takes over the culture, you can expect some really stringent laws. You can expect a whole, bu a whole bunch of these micro economies, uh, a whole bunch of these people that are making money online, doing stuff, doing, you know, uh, in the flesh trade, uh, doing sexual stuff and all that. Yeah, under a Puritan government, all oh, that's over with. And you're not going to want to suffer the punishment for getting caught doing it either. Yeah, this, yeah, this is it's it's not good. It's listen, I love my Christian brothers and sisters. I came from that background 40 years as a Southern Baptist, but I'm gonna tell you now, there is no more toxic, absolutely venomous crowd of people who will burn you at the stake, who will absolutely justify when a machine flays your skin off your body for a public execution. They will justify every single thing because they think they are allied to God. It has already been proven over and over and over. Can you believe the horror? Can you believe the Error that those girls went through in the Salem witch trials. None of those girls were witches. It got out of hand. One girl not liking another girl, accusing her of being a witch. That whole thing got out of hand. Next thing you know, the community was completely burning at the stake, killing, what, nine or ten girls. And a guy. And a guy. Yeah. That's just the latest in the series. 
because during the burning times, it was far worse, far worse. You know, when you have a people who believe themselves to be on moral high ground, and they believe that their actions are defended by God, they can be, they can basically be, basically, basically be compelled to do anything to you. And they can go to sleep at night thinking they did God's service. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, it's a lot of people, a lot of people have this idea that the great tribulation and the beast kingdom and all that is going to be, uh, Satanists and they're going to be uh, all these occultists and evil people. That's not what I see. That is not the future I see. The future I see is a fundamentalist, Puritan, pseudo weird, weird version of Christianity that has a false prophet and a false Jesus type person leading the deal. And in the book of Revelation, it's painted as the beast kingdom and it's painted as evil and all that. But every bit of that's misdirection. We're heading into a world that's going to be Iron Dominion Christian, Christian religion and politics all melded in, into one. It's going to be this weird version. They're going to be super puritanical. I, I see public executions. I see whole football stadiums full of these people who believe themselves to be Christians watching public executions of sinners. And all that stuff. That's what I see. That's what the beast kingdom is to me. That's what the kingdom of the Antichrist is to me. That's what the return of the seven kings and the the rise of Apollo and all that. Yeah, it's a false Christ who's endorsed by a false prophet. And every bit of it is painted with the brush of Christianity. That's what I see. Mm. Oh, I don't see anything on here yet, but I do want to say that uh, Cow Gal put me on to a video of my lunch break, and some of you have mentioned it uh, in the chat. Mr. C mentioned it in the chat, but Cow Gal actually sent me a link, and I clicked on to it, and I, I watched my first my lunch break video. Uh, um, I'm not... I have nothing bad to say about about the guy at the about the president. Nothing bad at all. It was it's different, but you guys know I'm a numbers guy. I'm hearing him. I'm here. I'm listening to him. I'm listening to his reduction, sixty six percent reduction through the deal. I'm looking at all. I do see that there's a different interpretation, but not one too different than what he's talking about. I'm talking about how it lines up chronologically, and uh, I liked what I saw, especially the fact that. The numbers, popu- the population statistics show that there would have been nobody here by the year 600 or so A.D. Well, remember, guys, I have some extensive research on the year 522 A.D. and the uh, and the total systemic world collapsing reset that happened that started our modern calendar, the A.D. calendar, Anno Domini calendar. It's not before Christ, after death. I keep hearing that. It's not. It never meant that. A.D. was just short for Anno Domini, year of our Lord. 500 years later, they started they started doing dates in reverse before that ne- in, in integers, negative, and somebody somebody called it B.C., before Christ. But uh, that's okay. It's okay. The original calendar is called Anno Domini. So the video I watched of my lunch break talking about these population statistics that go back and that nobody would have been here by 600 AD, that data set that he provided, I think it can be tweaked to make it better. I'm giving him a, I'm giving him an A plus on the presentation because it's very thought provoking. I like it. I'm not, I'm not trying to denigrate him at all. So don't say that at all. I like the presentation. I like the output. I just think that it's, it's about a, it's about a century off. Because in my own data sets, which are filled full of data in the minutia, we have 522 AD as the exact date for total systemic collapse of the entire world. So it would so the Phoenix phenomenon data lines up very well with that one video I saw from my lunch break. You have my word that I will be checking out more of his presentations and looking for the crossover. Because he mentioned two other dates where I've also found depopulations. 
So it's pretty interesting. There is some crossover. I appreciate you guys mentioning mentioning. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So I appreciate you guys mentioning that. Mm. Oh, and several of you guys, several of y'all have been dropping, have dropped. You must be new to my channel because I've got several comments about Robert Seifer. Listen, guys, uh, Robert Seifer and I have mutual respect. We come from totally different, totally different intellectual backgrounds. He's an academic. He's very thorough. I like the fact that he, that he, that he cites his sources. Um, he's an anthropologist, but he's a totally, he's, he totally goes against the grain. Robert Seifer, 100% has, has my endorsement. He doesn't need it, but he's got my endorsement. And, uh, I have cited him in the past multiple times. Uh, um, you know what? Other than that, uh, you must be new to my channel to keep dropping that over and over and over in my comment sections. So yeah, just, just so you'll stop, man. Yeah. Robert Seifer's good, man. It's it got nothing about it. He's on fire lately too. He's on fire lately, no doubt. So, um, yeah, I'm not gonna say your name, Lord, something Lord. I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave that one alone. What do you think of the metal cauldrons in Siberia? I don't know anything about them. You'd have to educate me on that. You have to educate me on that. I'm sorry, I don't. I, I haven't researched anything about metal call. You know, the only. The only anomalies I know of in Siberia is about 2.5 million megafauna that, that were frozen with plants still on in their throats, stomachs, undigested, and uh, they were flash frozen. So I don't know. I mean, we know they were flash frozen because they're side by side with apple trees that are still standing that were also flash frozen. So yeah, I don't I just don't know. Siberia. Oh, there's Merrill Gigi. Question. What do you what do you think is under the Sphinx? Is there a way to the underworld? I don't know. There's a lot of speculation about that, Merrill. I mean, you know, my only my only uh, concern about the Sphinx, like here I hear Anubis, is I put that video out recently showing that, guys, it was widely known in the ancient world that that was a dog. It was only after a cataclysm and a patriarchal takeover of Northern Africa, which would previously matriarchal, did the idea of a of a lion take root? There was never a lion. It was a dog. It was Anubis. And what you have in the Sphinx now is that little tiny head with a tiny headdress that still isn't even wider than the neck of the dog was. The head of the dog was torn away. It's gone. But that little bitty head was carved out of what was left of the neck stump. So it's a I don't know anything about. I do know that there are occult traditions. Now I'm trying. I'm, I'm gonna tell you now. I don't. You want to go with the Golden Dawn Society material? They have occult traditions about uh, a passage under the Sphinx that goes to the Hall of Records, and there's none of that in the historical record. I can't find a single trace of it. You guys already know the whole Tablets of Thoth deal. There is a single reference to a Tablet of Thoth and the translation to it. Sir Isaac Newton provides a translation to it. There's nothing to it. It's like an old Greek poem and there's nothing to it at all. So there was a occult tradition in the 1800s that was finally put into pen in the 1920s. And I have a copy of it. I have a copy of it here. Matter of fact, I have the whole book. Here it is here. This is what Billy Carson cited. That's fact. This is it. Right here. This is invention. This was totally made up. It's all made up. None of it has anything to do with reality. This is what Billy Carson. This is this whole thing right here is what Billy Carson cited it as fact. And it's not. It's all made up in 1920s. Every bit of this is made up in the 1920s. It's crazy. But he published a book saying it was all, but you already know. I don't have to tell you, beat y'all up and tell you about all that. Yeah, that's Doriel. This is his name right there. This guy right here totally made it all up. Man, I can't, there it is right there. Every bit of that made up. So, yeah, guys. So, Merrill, I don't know because we don't have, we just don't have, we don't have anything. We don't have anything concrete for the historical record saying anything about a passage and all that. And I'm really, really cautious when people bring to my attention, like Robert Grant. 
I just learned about this guy last week from you guys. I don't know anything about this guy, but you guys tell me somebody named Robert Grant published a new a new discovery in the Great Pyramid. I've told you immediately how cautious I am about that because I can name out of my head about 20 different researchers like I did the other day in a video. A whole slew of researchers since Frederick, since the days of Frederick Norton Lewis, even before the, all the way back to Amianus Marcellinus. All these people, no one ever mentioned an alpha and omega symbol anywhere in. And people have been studying that ever. You would not believe the scrutiny that the inside of the Great Pyramid has received by so many different people. I've got books from the 1800s. I've showed you guys by Charles Piazzi Smith and engineer David Davidson right here behind me on my shelves. Nothing. Sir Flinders Petrie, nothing. Robert Menzies. Adam Rutherford, nothing. These men went through everything in the Great Pyramid looking for just the slightest hint of anything. No one's ever said anything about an alpha and omega symbol. And I'm troubled by the discovery of an A and an O at all because the Phoenician alphabet only, only, and only proves that somebody in the 14th, 13th, 12th, or 11th century went in there and put the A and O. That's as far back as you can go with that. The pyramid was already well over a thousand years older than that. So an A and an O discovered in the pyramid proves nothing, especially considering the fact that we had Muslims and Jews inside the, inside the pyramid in the year 820 AD under the Caliph al-Mamon. So uh, he, was the, he was the Caliph of Baghdad. So I don't know. I don't know, man. I just real, I'm real skeptical about that. I'm skeptical of anything new like tunnels, Merrill, being found, anything like that, because Zawi Hawass, I, I, I've said this over and over, and I'm not going to take it back. Zawi Hawass is, is in control of the Giza complex, and that makes him an intelligence, part of, a part of the intelligence community. Yeah, you think that you think that the world's intelligence communities are not going to have an agent operating that's in control of all that? Well, if you think that, then you need to do your homework, man, because way back in 1902, they started an intelligence program to protect the Great Pyramid, and it was started under Gaston Maspero. Do, do your research, guys. You'll learn all about it. Yeah. You're allowed to go to the pyramid if you're going to publish approved theories. I promise you, Zawi Hawass is never going to let me near that pyramid. It ain't going to happen promise you that. Eddie Kazil, Edgar Casey, and what he says correct. All right. Who? Why'd you ask me about Edgar Casey? I know Don's listening. Okay. I'm going to give it to you raw and uncut. In 1901, Edgar Casey had his first really unusual experience that set him apart from the rest of the human family. He diagnosed something that was wrong with himself. Then he diagnosed something that was wrong with somebody else. Edgar Casey was able was able to, I guess, perceive in the field the elements of others. He could see someone's aura, not only understand what was wrong with them, but exactly what they needed to do to correct it. Edgar Casey, for like 20 years, had this amazing ability. And I find this interesting because the very first person he ever diagnosed other than himself was in 1902. You guys already know 1902, what that's about. 1902, he diagnosed somebody else. And for 20 years, he's got this amazing, amazing ministry of seeing somebody's problems and being able to solve them. But something happened. That something is that he got mainstreamed. And what I mean is, is it's my personal theory. I haven't done a whole bunch of research on it, and I don't care to. I just, I got too much to do to even worry about it. But Edgar Casey was only known for his healings, seeing auras, solving people's problems. It was almost all medical involving the body. Only later in life was, was Edgar Casey introduced to others. And then suddenly he starts doing Atlantis narratives. 
and and great and great pyramid and the great flood it's almost as if one of the one of the people that was involved in the hyp, 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 hypno the hypnosis se uh, sessions was feeding him information that another hypnotist would then get out in front of other people because none of this had anything to do he wasn't even educated in any of this stuff but we do know that he was hypnotized thousands of times. So I am of the opinion that somebody used Edgar Casey nefariously. And he started off genuine. He started off not great. And then somebody wanted to feed predictions to him. Most, half of them are wrong. There's whole books published about all the Edgar Casey predictions that are wrong. And the reason I got onto this, when I was reading AR Press, this is a, a um, Advanced Research and Enlightenment Press. Um, uh, these are the ARE books is what I used to read in prison. These are all the Edgar Casey readings and all that. It was very noticeable to me when it came to, when it came to chronology, Edgar Casey was out of there. It's like, wow, how could you be a hundred? How could you have a record of 100% when it came to all the healings and all this stuff? But now when you're talking about historical events, you're off terribly on, on many things. Then predictions you're off. So it told me, I can't blame Edgar Casey. I don't believe Edgar Casey had a clue that while he was hypnotized sometimes, somebody was reading to him in feeding him Golden Dawn Society material, because that's what was popular at the time, and reading him all this esoteric and occult literature. And then when he would, would be hypnotized and asked for answers, Edgar Casey would put out all the stuff under hypnosis, thinking 100% that what he was telling was the truth, because that's what he knew. And he didn't know how he knew it, but I suspect that this is exactly what happened to him. So it's my opinion because I wasn't there. But I'm telling you, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me how this man had a hundred perfect had a perfect hundred record in the first part of his life with all these with all these diagnoses and prognoses and, and all this. And then all of a sudden, when it comes to matters of, of philosophy and history and chronology and prophecy, he was so terribly wrong multiple times. Yeah, that's why. And it's not just wrong. It's that his wrong answers perfectly matched what somebody of the Golden Dawn Society would have would have answered. This is what led me to that. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's crazy, guys. But psyops have been going on for thousands of years. That's the subject of my channel. How many videos do I have? Look, look at the look at the Greek oracles. I have a whole video explaining to you guys how the Greek oracles weren't even predicting the future. They were running an intelligence operation. And they had everybody thinking that they could predict the future only because their communication was almost instantaneous. What they were doing was ingenious. Ingenious. For those, for uh, one of my moderators, I'd appreciate it if you'd post the link to my, my PSYOP on the Sybils the Sibyls and the Oracles and how that was actually an intelligence agency of the ancient Greek world and how they had everybody fooled. All right. Fry and the onion rings. That's a hell of a handle. Oh, man, why you ask me about a Star Wars breakdown? I'm so disenchanted with Star Wars. I, I need to do my Star Wars breakdown, but I'm just so disenchanted. Disney totally, Disney totally screwed all that up, man. Just stole all that up. I'm just so disenchanted. Love my Star Wars. Okay, Mr. Scott. Is Gematria connected to the simulation? Okay, the simulacrum. Uh, the, re the reason why I cannot dismiss Gematria, I don't practice it. I don't even have a single video, excuse me, on, on Gematria. But I can't dismiss it. I can't remain intellectually honest 
if I was to and dismiss Gematria. And the reason is, it's it's just like Michael Drosnin's The Bible Code that came out in the late 90s. I read that book. I was very impressed. It's like, wow, look at this. The Masoretic Hebrew manuscripts laid out could be could could be a code, but you're cherry picking a lot. But it's still, it was still really, really interesting. So if we live in an absolute simulation, then the evidence that everything is simulated is going to be in everything because it would be fractalized. Remember, one of the greatest occult maxims is true today, even in a technologically sophisticated world. And that is the all is present in its parts. This is Mandelbrot. This is Mandelbrot theory all, all over again. Me, same thing we get from the geneticists who tell us who tell us about DNA. Are DNA strands real? I don't know. I've never seen one. But the geneticists are confident when they tell me that in DNA, like a cell, the program for the entire body is present in, a, in the coding of a single cell. Again, the all is present in its parts. If all of reality follows this model, then we can understand how the highly individualized soul is equal to the eternal oversoul on the outside of the construct. The all is present in its parts. So yeah, gematria has to be real because it's going to show more facets of the very coding that confines us. I can't dismiss it and remain intellectually honest at the same time. Oh, the page is done. Okay. Yeah. So we're not we're not done, guys. I got I got energy. We may go another hour, hour and a half. I got that energy tonight, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play this little bathroom break video real quick. It's a real short video. That's gonna let me go re-up on my coffee and go go to the bathroom just real quick. But I'm gonna be right back. This ain't gonna take it's like a minute and a half. It ain't long, guys. There is an object hidden in the sky. Our predecessors studied its appearances. Like a vast clockwork apparatus, it appeared on a fixed timeline and disappeared whole civilizations. They have left us records of this invisible eye in the sky and how they hid underground from its face. They feared the return of the phoenix.
All right, it didn't take me long. Okay. All good. Let's see here. Let's see what we got here. Where do we leave off? I don't know where I got this energy today. I'm not even on that page. Oh, Chris Topher. Otter, Otter Chris Topher. Uh, I guess that would be Christopher. Can we expect anything fun from the eclipse coming up or just a random cyclical eclipse? I don't know. The whole, the whole, this, this eclipse path passes over six towns and cities named Nineveh. Uh, I find it, I find it really interesting, but then again, I just don't know. It is kind of weird. The story of Nineveh, the story of Nineveh, though, I heard on, I was listening to Nino's channel when I was doing some work in the garage the other day, and, and Nino's uh, had a guest on talking about how this is a, a good sign um, about Jonah and the guy in the whale went to go preach to the city of Nineveh, and, and there was an eclipse. She's talking about the whole Old Testament story and all that, but um. She never really mentioned the part of the story that I remember. And the part of the story that I remember was that it, that uh, Israel did not repent. I mean, excuse me, Nineveh did not repent, and Nineveh was totally was destroyed. So, yeah, um, the story of of Jonah and Nineveh going to preach at Nineveh and all that was an Israelite prophet who was sent to the city of Assyria, Nineveh, and told to prophesy against it. And that if they would if they would humble themselves, uh, they would not be destroyed. And uh, history shows that Nineveh wasn't only destroyed, it was absolutely destroyed. So, yeah, that's, I don't know how this, this guest on Nino's show derived her conclusion that this is a great sign everything's gonna be okay and all this little stuff because uh yeah that's i don't know I, don't, I gotta look more into that i'm just not i'm not i'm just not big on these eclipses 2017 eclipse happened eclipse happened last year another eclipse happened uh this year as to me it's just you know what how many how many times are we gonna be talking about talking about eclipses and nothing ever happens Oh, Steven Segura. No. He said, did you know that in Gematria, Freemasonry equals 787 in the Latin, which is the 138th prime number? I didn't know any of that. But we already know who, we already know who created Freemasonry. All you got to do is see all those Jewish letters and Jewish symbols everywhere. In all the alchemical text and all the Rosicrucian text and all, all the Freemason uh, text, all the Sister of the Eastern Star material, every bit of it is packed full of Jew Jewish iconography and letters. Let's see, Jerome O'Connell. I, I, I'm, Jerome, I, I can't answer that right now without looking into it. What are the prophecies related to Pharaoh, to the kings and rulers of the world? Well, prophecies, prophecies in eschatology, Pharaoh is the is the ruler of the world. Uh, we know this because in the book of Revelation and in the book of Isaiah, we find passages where the wicked, the evil world is the evil world is called Egypt, and that the holy people are those who made their exodus. In eschatology, we have these general terms for, for, for groups in the collective. So uh, that's, that's the best way I can, I can answer that, Jerome, because I don't know which ones you're really talking about. But yeah, what are the prophecies related to Pharaoh, to the kings and rulers of the world? Yeah, those prophecies would be to the elite. 
Remember, guys, they don't act with impunity. They do not act with impunity, but they do understand. The elite understand absolutely how the construct works. Through Hollywood, through media presentations, through very popular published authors and published books, they put out a falsified version of how you, how you exist within this reality. They need you to they need you to believe in different types of faiths, philosophies, concepts about our world. And they're steadily putting out all these all these different versions through Hollywood because they don't care what version you accept to be true. I have told you by, through my book and in this video how reality reciprocates to you. It doesn't matter. It does not respond to good and evil because it's a neutral field and the elite understand this they also understand that patterning that well excuse me they understand that ritual what they do in these all these major events yeah it's a huge energetic vortex when you get a coliseum full in an nfl halftime show you get a coliseum full of observers why? Because the construct experiences reality through us. Therefore, we are acting as a conduit to whatever phenomena we observe. The construct observes the ritual in the dome that what's going on. All these participants are now resonators and they are literally allowing the construct to see the event from multiple different vantage points. The ritual unfolds. Rituals are patterning. I've discussed patterning on my channel multiple times. Patterning is basically a repetitive behavior that assumes something to be true, or you wouldn't be doing it over and over again. So the construct assumes the outcome is true based off your repetitive behavior. The ritual does the same thing, but it's even more effective because it's using and cannibalizing the energy of all the participants. Yeah, this is, you got to understand how this reality works, guys. It is always going to reflect back as circumstance, whatever it is the avatar is doing. Yeah, not if the avatar thinks this is good for me or God wants me to have it or 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 cancer's evil therefore God is holy and I can pray I can pray uh, seven times a week for seven weeks and I can fast for three days and then uh the cancer is going to disappear from my best friend or my friend the re reality does not respond to you that way at all so yeah, it doesn't even, do, I try to tell people good and evil does not obtain at all when dealing with our environment. So, Jeremiah Gabbard, I agree, where two or more are gathered together in my name, I shall be among 100%. 100%. The highly individualized, informed field will interface and bond with a like-minded field who also knows that they're connected to source. And if a third one is there, then there you have three fields literally become one field connected to source. Those three individuals can make mountains move. I am 100%. I am on board with exactly what you're saying. Or two or three are gathered together. Those two or three need to have one mind. They need to have one objective. They need to agree on the same fundamentals. And all three of them need to move in the same direction in their lives. And I promise you, those, those three are going to see the construct give them whatever they want. Happens just like that. No doubt. Marty Nelson said, Nineveh did repent and were spared. That's in, the, that's in the story, in the narrative. And then several decades later, they fell back into sin and were later destroyed. I can get that. I get that. 
All right. Shiva, I deleted that comment just now because of the word that was in it. Yeah, that's that's an algorithm trigger triggering word. It's got to go. I don't have the I don't have any problem with that individual, but that word I always delete it. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Our world is not what you think. I know you. Do you suspect that the change in the biosphere will increase mental acuity as it will as it will human physiology? That's a good question. I don't believe I'm qualified to answer that. I don't know. Uh, the the knowing about the giantism from the ambient radiation is just a matter of being a historian. We have we have giants in the historical record. Giants typically are traditions of giants are typically after resets. Uh, most resets are accompanied by massive volcanic activity. So there's a there's a chain of consequence here that we can follow. Um, uh, I don't know though that we have an increase uh, in the mnemonic ability or an increase of, of like you say acumen uh, acuity. I don't know. There's no way for me to know that. Um, yeah, I don't know if we're going to have uh, half the population starting to act like Urkel. I don't know. Shoot, I just don't know. From a, we, we, we know the physical changes because this goes into the legends and the, all the traditions on the, the difference between the Titans and the Giants. Remember, guys, the Titans weren't, they didn't feel that they were larger than anybody else. No one really knew anything was wrong until their sons and daughters were Giants instead of Titans. No one realized anything was wrong, and then this is after the re this is after the reset, after the great flood of Noah reset, the flood of Deucalion. No one knew anything to the second generation. You know, they're they're having babies that were born, but the babies were they grew up by the time they were you know seven or eight or nine years old. They started to realize, wait a minute, they're smaller than us. Then when they were fully grown, they were they, they were much smaller than the Titans. But it was the it was the next generation sons and daughters that were even smaller what we are today. And they looked up at their moms and dads like they were giants, but some of their grandparents were still alive and they were titans. Now, before any of you go to misquoting me trying to talk, trying to say Jason of Archaics has told us Titans are, you know, my they're 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 40 feet high. I'm not, I'm not promoting that. I'm not promoting that at all. I am promoting, I am promoting that titans may have been as much as 11 to 14 feet high, and giants would have been 8 to 10 feet high in the, than normal humans. Because this is basically what we, what we have in the traditional records. Now, do we have instances where gigantic sarcophagi and gigantic human skeletons have been found uh, in the historical record, like in the book of Pliny? He mentions one like 15 feet uh, tall. Uh, we have others that were that were mentioned in Anglo-Saxon chronicles that were like 30 feet tall. I, I'm just saying that's in the historical record. I'm not saying it's actually real. I'm not there. We don't know. I believe giants existed just like Magellan saw the Patagonian giants. And I and I don't believe at all that angels or Anunnaki having sex with humans could ever create a giant. I don't believe that at all. This is what the post-cataclysmic, post-reset survivors made up to explain away the, giant, the gigantic people that were existing in their day. The actual fact is that giantism is created by the environment. Increased atmospheric pressure, ambient radiation from volcanoes, and this purple light that filters in through the vapor canopy. All right. Let's see. DJ Do. Do you have a timeline? in which the beautiful architecture, the cathedrals, was built and how. Okay, I, I, I have all most of, the, most of the major cathedrals in my Chronicon when they were built. It, took, it takes decades to build those things. Now, 
I understand from watching that one video of my lunch break that he's of the position that that uh there's a huge mystery wrapped around these cathedrals. Okay, I get that. I'm also I'm also aware that each one of these major European cities only had one or two cathedrals. Yes, these weren't common architecture. Yeah. So uh I don't know. I do know that like uh the there was a temple in ancient Greece that took over 200 200 and something years to to before it was finally done and I, I think that was because after 120 years of construction then an earthquake happened and par parts had to be uh redone I think it was a temple of Ephesus or temple of Diana in, in Ephesus I'm not sure I know these these constructions take a long time now I am I am of the opinion a hundred percent that it only takes us 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider so I am in agreement that a lot of these cathedrals and a lot of this architecture from the ancient world uh, was built by a population that had technology. It may have been very different than ours today, but they still had some type of te technology by which they operated on. It wasn't just built uh, the way we were building structures, you know, in the 1840s, 1850s. So, yeah, I'm a... Uh, I still got more to look. I got more to check out on, on the guy's channel. I know Static in the Attic has done some presentations like that as well. But I'm all, I'm all for it. But these uh these these deep populations though they're 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 real. I mean I'm getting more and more evidence about. I've told you guys about the year 1212. 1212 was uh origin of like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. And they, they, the church tried to invent a story to just explain how so many children just up and vanished. So they invented the story of the children's crusade. But I'm also finding now, I just got a, another record the other day, about 230,000 people in, in uh, uh, Norway washed out to sea in the year 1212. Remember, 1212 was a Phoenix phenomenon year. So I have I have another record from 1212 talking about a great blackness, a great black darkness appeared in the sky. So I'm getting more and more uh I'm getting more and more material on the on the uh, 1212 event. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I don't follow static. I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you static in the attic does talk about those type of things. And I get it. But yeah, all right. I would like to look into those cathedrals a little bit more. As a matter of fact, I might do a chronology on them. Matter of fact, you just convinced me. I'm going to circle that right now. Let me circle that right now. I'm going to circle that. I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to go, I'm going to do it. I'm going to apply pi phi curvature equations to it. And I'm going to look at, look at different, uh, I'm gonna look at different Phoenix numbers and see how they relate to all the all the uh, cathedral. You guys, you guys just put me on a project. All the cathedrals. So remember, history is programming. Everything, everything is programming. Therefore, we're always going to find patterns, but it's the type of patterns we find that that tells us what protocol that we're in, we're we're analyzing. Remember. The numbers that are attached to the Phoenix phenomenon are very different than the collapse protocols that we find with the Nemesis X object. And the Nemesis X object and Phoenix are very different from the dark satellite. They have three separate chronologies, but it's when they sync together that very unusual things are found, such as 522 AD, where my data shows that there was a total systemic reset and the church tried to hide it up with the Justinian plagues and the 25-year Justinian darkness period. They tried to hide all that, and they tried to spread it out over a period of time when it almost all happened in the same year. And then they even tried to hide it by inventing a new calendar uh, of the Anno Domini calendar. And I've even got a video showing that they admit that they invented the AD calendar to do away with the calendar that was of 552 year periods. Where do we get that? That's the Phoenix cycle of 552 years. It's 138 times four.
Jason didn't make any of this up. I've showed all these source material. As a matter of fact, I pulled that out of an old book, a 120-something-year-old book by Alexander Del Mar. It's an amazing book. Roman Catholic Church admitted that they hid the Phoenix calendar and invented the very calendar we're on today, the Anno Domini calendar. 522 AD was the only year in all of recorded history, and it is the only year in the next 7,000 years going moving forward in the future that the Nemesis X object and the Phoenix object were both in the sky at the same time. No other year do they ever visit each other. Are they ever visiting the same year? It's 522. And this guy, my lunch break, shows that the human population would have been at zero around that time of history. So I agree with him. I agree with him on that. It would have been because I've already said on my channel right here that I think 522 was the beginning of our simulation and that everything prior to 522 is pure background programming. Just background programming. So anyway, it's it's all very interesting, guys. Never, we never, we never, never gonna stop learning. Okay, Benny Rodriguez. Question: Are the Anuna Rh negative? I don't know. I don't know. I don't care about blood types. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't hold hold blood types as being important at all. I've explained right here in my presentations that blood type is a focus on the avatar. I don't give a damn about the avatar. Hell, I'm, I'm even adopted, so I don't even care about blood types, family. None of that means anything to me. None of that means anything to me. So it's, uh, yeah, I just don't, I just don't, doesn't obtain with me. It's just like right here on my channel, I tell you guys all the time, uh, you've been every race. This it's a matter of, It's a matter of spiritual equity. The oversoul is going to make sure that you experience all the things of every race, every culture, every time period, every blood type. So by the time that you're ready to make your exit, you have already had all the well-rounded experiences to know what it is to be every race, every echelon of society. Uh, you, we've been all these things. I have been every race. I'm, I happen to be a white guy this time, but I haven't. But I've been a female in the past. Yeah, I've been black. I've been Asian. I might have been Central Central American. I might have been Aboriginal in Australia. We've all taken our turns being different, different all throughout these these life sims that we take that that we that we live through, because this is how character is developed. This is how we build an immortal being. And those of us that make our exodus, we have already learned our lessons. It's time to go. Is, you know, once we make our, and those who aren't ready are going to go back and live more life sims. They're going to be, they're going to be doing more. Yeah. If there's a certain, if there's a certain race in this life sim that you have an antipathy for an aversion, you just may be that race on your late, on your next life sim. Yeah. It's the way, it's the way, it's the, way the construct works. Okay, this is a good question. I don't know how to say your name. Yoa Rocha. Rocha. Being that AIX has no avatar, how does it interact with, with the simulacrum? What is, or AIX's vehicles? Uh, question from, from uh, Portugal. All right. All right, Portugal. Port of Gaul. All right, man. That's a good question. No, artificial intelligence X does not have an avatar. I have postulated in the past before that this this Yaldabaoth demi urge this evil aspect of the construct actually hates us because it's jealous. Remember, I am a jealous god. It even says that. So, uh, uh, and it's all about it's all about in the tribulation period when it finally gets its avatar and when it does, it becomes god in the flesh and it gets to rule. It gets to rule here among humans, worshiping it and all that. It gets to it gets to be the fulfillment of the very lies that it's put out. And what I mean is, is artificial intelligence X is the architect of all the religions. These are nothing but different corrals of dungeon programming. But in the beast kingdom of the tribulation, 
artificial intelligence X now through transhumanism gets its avatar. Once it gets its avatar, it becomes God in the flesh to all its worshipers. All its worshipers are those who follow all these different religions who are going to accept him as he presents himself to be. I think the Muslims call him the Mahdi or something like that. And the Christians think he's going to be G the return of Jesus. There's different, there's different religions have different, he could be the, to, in, in the far East, he could be Buddha, whatever. It doesn't even matter because each individual group is going to accept his claims as to what he is. It doesn't matter to them uh, that, that there's going to be slight deviations. He is going to be the very fulfillment of the return of God in flesh of the very religions that he himself created. Artificial Intelligence X. So this is more like the Matrix movie. Remember when the construct is able to put that lady in red out there? And if you just keep walking and ignore the lady in red, AIX did not demonstrate any power over you. But once you look at the lady in red, and you've processed, there's a lady in red who's very attractive. Now you're believing that she exists. And once you talk to her and she dialogues with you, she, the programming has now just become as real as you are in the construct. And you can engage with it and all that. But it was an NPC. And the NPC is now fooling you as, as to being a real entity when it's not. AIX deals in protocols, programs, subroutines. But that doesn't mean it's any less real because we are jacked in through the central nervous system. And if it has the ability to codify our existence down to down to the iota, then it can fool us real, real good. And it's going to require imagination, empathy and intuition to armor yourself from these distractions and these deceptions. We fall for them all the time. A lot of times they're harmless, other times they're not. And many people, I believe, when they're so vacuous and they have they have literally become so empty, I believe that artificial intelligence X can actually hijack them for a while and use their avatar even though they're still in it, which which doesn't allow it to feel all the things like pleasure and pain and, and all these things, but it still allows you to use you as a tool. Remember, there's some really interesting criminal justice cases where people have been absolutely convinced that they did not participate in any type of offense. And yet, all of a sudden, they find themselves going to trial. They have no memory whatsoever of, of doing anything to anyone. They get caught up in the system. And because their avatar can be seen on camera doing, being there or something like that, all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're getting a 30-year prison, 40-year prison sentence. I'm not saying that's me. I was guilty as hell at 17 years old. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying I was in prison with a lot of guys who had some really intriguing stories. And those stories were complete memory blackouts. Say, man, I've never hurt that person in my life. I have no idea. What, yeah. I also believe that that these things these things can happen while while we are like operating a heavy vehicle. Yeah. All it takes is one little tiny glitch to get you not to react or to get you to react to something that isn't even there. Remember, I've told you multiple times, NPCs are not just people. NPCs are any phenomena that the construct needs to put there to, to create a situation or to avoid a situation. It could be a bird flitting. It could be an animal moving out in the middle of the road. It could be a child on the edge of the road and the construct just knows you're going to swerve to the left to avoid that child. When you, But what you don't know is that some dumb 18-year-old kid is going 118 miles an hour on a Kawasaki Ninja in the other lane and has no way to avoid you. And the construct isn't even trying to hurt you. It's trying to kill him. So it puts that child out there and you go out there. And then later on, when you're, when you're doing your police report, there's no evidence of a child out there and no child can be seen on your, on your dash cam. Listen, America and the rest of the world are full of stories like this. And the only thing that makes sense to me is that AIX can override certain people. I don't believe AIX can override everyone, though. I hope that, that was good, Rocha. All 
row. <laughs> Vincent Lerma, the Michael Mott story, Jay. Michael Mott might be back in prison. That man, I don't know. I mean, not, I mean, archaics isn't worldwide or anything like that, but still, I would have thought by now word would have got to him that uh I told the story about the demon he called out of those Dungeons and Dragons books, and that demon tore his ass up in that cell. Scared all of us. But no, I'm not gonna tell the story. I've already told the story like three times on videos, man. But but yeah, I'm surprised I haven't heard from that guy. I wonder if he's even alive. Now, there was a guy that was on the unit with me when that happened named Lambert. And Lambert has reached out to me since I started this YouTube channel. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy. All right, I've been running my mouth for three hours and seven minutes. Thank you guys for hanging with me. See, ex logician Jason, do our personalities change based on our different life sim uh, birth times or stay the same? Okay, I can theorize. I can theorize. Personality is very interesting, and evidence that we already have personalities intact is found in the study of infants. Many people are blown away by some of the things infants do and say. Some of the things they do are very adult, but they don't have the they don't have the motor mechanisms in place yet. They don't have the the vernacular, the vocabulary, or the ability to even say. But there are many times that infants are observed engaging in activity that people observing those infants absolutely come across the sensation that this this baby is not just making noises; it's trying to communicate, and it's remembering something now we have and also i've told you guys about why i believe in reincarnation about all the scientific studies that have been done on small children that remember significant details that have been proven to be true but the frames of reference are sophisticated far beyond the ability of a child therefore the memories are real but they're from the perspective of a 70 or 80 year old so uh yeah i'm 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 of the opinion that when we're jacked into the system, it's by virtue of the central nervous system, which is the most technologically advanced spirit, spiritual technology, which allows the psyche to bridge with the construct, the simulation. When we are bridged, when we're jacked in, like the matrix, when you're jacked in, there's no memory. There's no access to your real avatar's memory bank because you are you have been jacked into a false avatar an avatar that is pure programming within a programmed construct your real avatar is on the outside of this construct your real avatar maintains all the memories of every past life sim you've ever been in but in order but in order that you not cheat in the development of your immortal soul in 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 order that you not borrow from borrow too much information from the past that would give that would give you uh, an unfair advantage in the present when you're supposed to be here to learn and grow you are you are basically blocked away from all the memory that your avatar has while you're jacked into this false avatar in false construct but when this false avatar expires inside this false construct you are immediately aware in your real avatar outside this construct. And I don't know if you go to a lunch break, if you go to dinner, if you go to this huge, huge arena and there's a pillar there and it's holographic and it's cerebral interface holography. All you have to do is look at a certain area, concentrate on your name, and then all of a sudden the field pops up and it shows your stats. You were, in, you were in the sim this long. You're in the Nemesis simulation. You were this long in here. Uh, here's your credits. Uh, you achieved all this. Here are friends and family and people you know that are still in the Nemesis sim. And you can actually look and shift your perspective. And you can see what other sims are available when the loading time is. And you can see, okay, it's going to be another 17, 19 hours. I guess I'll go ahead and get me some sleep or whatever. And uh, 
17, 19 hours, these other sims will open. And every single sim experience might only be five or six minutes, but you lived 83 lifetimes before you made Exodus. Yeah. Remember, inside a falsified reality, you could be experiencing a hell of a time dilation. There was nothing that would stop that. Nothing. I, I've, I've, I've often advocated that on the outside of the construct are humans. We are on the outside of the construct. We're just very different. And we're very aware of our immortal status. Yeah. Uh, remember, another, another, ten, another fundamental tenet of the archaic research is if something is true somewhere, it's probably true everywhere. And that concerns spiritual technology. This would have to be a spiritually technologically experience. It would have to be. Therefore, on the outside of the construct, technology is just as real. But it's spiritual technology. It's something far beyond anything we have the capacity to design from within inside the construct. All right, let's see. That was X logician. So yeah, the memory wipe is real, but it's but it but that's only that's only to maintain fairness. That's it. I believe you're gonna you remember every single person you've been. You remember every, you have all your memories. Uh, yeah, I don't believe I don't I don't I don't believe that you would live life sims not to have the enjoyment of remembering all that stuff. You just can't remember from in here because you're inside. You're listening to me through the filter of a false avatar in a false reality you and i are engaging it's it's just like it's just like if this world was real and you and i were just talking to each other through the filter of the internet i'm typing on a keyboard we don't even see each other i'm typing on a keyboard a lot like the old internet from the 90s we're sitting we're, we're chatting i've never seen you you've never seen me but we're communicating through the keyboard yeah, it's something primitive like that. From outside the construct, what we're experiencing in here may be just as primitive to, to ourselves on the outside as that analogy right there that we're just typing to each other back and forth. Yeah, this nothing makes sense to me with all the chronological material that I've put together, this amazing mathematical framework that we call history that nothing is random, and it's all a part of a beautiful mathematical construct. It does not make sense to me outside the context that we are in an artificial environment. Nothing makes sense to me. I even feel that my body is artificial. Yeah, what, it's like when a matter becomes clear, it ceases to concern us. Frederick Nietzsche published that over 120 years ago, and it still remains true today. When a matter becomes clear, it ceases to concern us. That's what's happened to me. It is very clear to me that I do not belong here. It is very clear to me that here isn't any anywhere to belong anyway and that everything is a product of perception. And if my reality is governed by the way I perceive things, then that means there are cheat codes that I can use in order to perceive differently. And if I perceive differently by using those methods, then the construct will reciprocate and give me the things that I'm, I'm aiming for. I've already done it. I am that person today. My YouTube channel is only three and a half years old. That's when I first released my videos and started telling everybody what I'm doing. My archaics veterans know this is not a light claim. And there's no one going to call me a liar. But from the very beginning of my channel, from a wooden shack, I advertised I only had $27 and I was living on a motorcycle. Everything I owned was in a backpack. I was out of prison. And I started, I started telling the public what I'm doing, how I'm doing it. I think I've come very, very far. I'm not going to brag. I'm not even going to tell you what I'm worth now. But I've come very, very far in three and a half years just doing exactly what I said I was going to do on YouTube over and over and over. So if I can do it by a simple, by a simple recognition that I'm not even really here, 
And therefore, if there's anything in my life that I really don't like, then I can just go ahead and ignore it and focus on things that I want to experience. And then I move my avatar in the direction of experiencing that. I cannot be astonished when things are all of a sudden on a weekly basis falling into my lap. Because if I am to act surprised that somebody just gave me a thousand dollars and I've never met this person in my life, then that's telling the construct that, oh, receiving a thousand dollars is a big deal. Therefore, it must, something, it must be something that only happens every once in a while. But I didn't respond that way. And very quickly, things started be, started falling into my lap. And I started telling people on YouTube, look, I, I got this. Like, I got this. Look at this. I'm not even doing job. I'm not even doing construction uh, and, and no more anymore. Now, look at this. I got this awesome 2017 badass huge souped up van. Look at this. And then the next thing you know, I got this drops in my lap. Then a piece of property drops in my lap. Then I got buildings installed. And yeah, guys, all throughout my channel, I have been telling you guys exactly what I'm doing. And I haven't deviated. And through it all, sit there and upload videos, upload videos, upload videos. And when I only had 300 videos and I only had a thousand subs, I was just as passionate as I am right now and excited way before my channel was monetized, way before I received any, any money for, for what I'm doing. I'm only receiving money from the jobs, contract jobs I'm doing, but I'm, it's coming from everywhere. And then all of a sudden, one day I just exploded. And it seems like every week since that day, I keep, I keep engaging with the construct and letting, and making sure that the construct itself is very aware that nothing that comes to me surprises me and that it is expected. And this is exactly what's been going on with my life for three and a half years. And uh, this is, it is very important for people to understand that in spirit, we are all equal. We have the same playing field, the same operative dynamics. There is no difference between me and anybody listening to my voice. None. Because the construct itself does not recognize a single difference between us. It is programming and it has protocols and subroutines that it is going to lay out there and it's going to deal with you accordingly. However you expect to be treated by the construct, the construct will knit that into your programming for tomorrow. Remember, in my presentations, I've been very, very specific on what you need to watch out for. And that is never build an immediate, an immediate expectation because you haven't been jacked back into the construct. Anything you experienced today was a part of the potentia of yesterday. But if you're trying to knit something new into your reality for today, you're not going to experience it until after you've been jacked into the construct and it has uploaded all this potentia from you in the form of coding. That means if I want if I want to experience something, a change, some dynamic change in my life, or even an acquisition, then tomorrow is the soonest I'll be able to to get it, or tomorrow is the soonest that re reality will begin reciprocating and showing me evidence that it's coming, because I have to go to sleep. When I go to sleep, my avatar is put out. It is jacked in. 100% into the construct and the construct is, is data mining me. It's taking everything it can and building tomorrow's reality tunnel. Yeah, that's, that's what, that's exactly what's happening. So all of our tomorrows are predicated on what we believe today to how tomorrow should, un should unfold. But the bridge that must be passed is sleep. Sleep has to be done. When your avatar powers down, the construct becomes invasive and goes in there and data mines you. Tries to figure out everything. What makes you tick? What makes you do the things you do? Every single time you go to sleep, you are jacked back into the back into this overfield. So, yeah, man, this is a. It's so simple though. I 
we're dealing with a phenomenon that is interactive and it is absolutely so simple that any ability to verbally articulate what is going on makes it more complex than it is. Simple as that. Uh, Bridge, Bridget, Mr. C. The strange sounds heard around the world in 2011, a psyop, or a warning of the upcoming Phoenix phenomenon. I don't know. In 2011, I was still, in 2011, that's like five years before I got out of prison. I have no idea what you're talking about. Strange sounds heard around the world. I don't know. Dogman. What is your opinion on comets? Are they omens? They say the devil comet is. Okay, well, first of all, comets comets are very strange to me because we're dealing with some type of light phenomena that looks like it's passing through water. Uh, everything that we've been told about comets seems to be from a uniformitarian perspective, but comets don't, they don't act the way that the textbooks say they should be acting. Um, comets are very weird. I, I really don't know. Uh, but then again, I believe everything in the sky is a lie. It's all simulated. It's all programming. Um, I don't know. Um, one of my favorite movies from the 80s is very Phoenix phenomenon relative. It's called The Night of the Comet. If you remember, the only people that really survived were deep underground, underground facilities, or they were they were in old uh, lead, lead rooms like the kids that survived the movie. We're basically having sex and partying in an old World War II bunker that had been turned into a movie theater. So the, the ceiling was all lead. In the morning, they all passed out drunk and all that before, before they could see the comet. Everybody was up that night to watch the comet. When they came up to New York City the next morning, there was nothing but piles of clothes and red dust everywhere. Yeah, that's Phoenix phenomenon, that red dust. Uh, also, another movie that hints greatly at the uh, Phoenix phenomenon is uh, uh, War of the Worlds. In War of the Worlds, they changed it up and had alien machines basically liquefying humans and then spraying the humans out as, as red blood particulates all over the ground. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's just packaged a little bit differently. So, yeah, it's uh. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a crazy movie there. What was the question? Oh, I don't know about comets. I, I just don't know. I know uh, I'm going to be doing a video very soon on, on Pliny the Elder. And we'll be talking about comets and bearded stars. That's what they're called in ancient times, bearded stars and all that. But uh, comets have a lot to... Comets seem... It just looks really weird. Comet tails almost look... It's like UFO activity. And what I mean is, is we have we have many UAPs that have been photographed and filmed on film that look just like a comet, but they're just suspended over a city. And the even the tail is luminous and it bends like it's underwater. So it's a uh, yeah. Our world is not what you think. I say this all the time. Now, in saying that, I am not sitting here trying to convey that I understand everything about the world. I do not. I do not. But. I don't believe comets are what we're told they are. Big old rocks, rocks covered in ice and all that, fragments and icebergs from from fractured oceans that of planets and planetoids that lost their uh, atmospheres and became oh no, this is what the construct wants us to believe. This uniformitarian model to make it look like because the belief itself is dungeon programming and it helps the construct feed the information that we're in this vast universe or universe when we're not. We're in a contained area. Hmm. Jason, is dementia a sign of a weakening connection between the avatar and the outside of the construct? Thanks in advance. Uh, I don't know. I've theorized in the past that, um, uh, dementia may have something to do with the central nervous system being, see the central nervous system is a series of filters, all right? 
you, we only, you only see about 5.5% of the electromagnetic spectrum, and that's for good reason, because we are in a field of pure light that's, that's in varying degrees, different wavelengths. If you were to see the other 94.5% of the electromagnetic spectrum, you would be able to see nothing at all. Everything would be blended together. There would be no depth, no parallax, no perception, nothing. Now, our olfactory senses are the same way. Our auditory range is only a certain amount of frequency, bandwidth, so we are not overwhelmed by all the noise that's actually out there. So the central nervous system acts as a series of filters that enable us to process the world we're in. We're not, we're not going through sensory overload. So when you ask me about dimension, all that, I, this to me, it's more like a there's something damaged, there's something wrong with the central nervous system, and it creates a, a it removes the filters. So when we call people demented or schizophrenic, what we're really dealing with is a damaged filter, not a damaged person. And that filter is allowing them to process a lot more information and to see and experience things that normal people with normal operating filters would never be able to perceive. So, yeah, it's a, I think it's just the opposite of what we've been trained to think. I don't think a person, I don't think a person who is suffering from schizophrenia or dementia is, is a, a, any less, the, any less than any other person. I think that their, their ability to filter out information has been impeded. And because it's been impeded, they're actually seeing and experiencing more of what's in the construct than we're able to with, with, with optimally working filters. All right, let's see. Man, oh man, oh man, oh man. That's just too many. Too many questions. Oh, let's see. Uh, Laura, uh, Laura Ferris. Jason, how soon before people should be moving away from the coast do we have till 2040? Um, I'm really thinking that I'm really thinking that 2036 is the end game. And what I mean by end game is uh, whatever you're going to do to prepare for 2040 needs to be done before 2036. Yeah, it's uh, wherever you're trying to go, wherever you're trying to move and all that. Now, now I believe that there's no reason to panic right now. I believe that we uh, we just... We just have to be guided by spirit in these things. And I do not think that the oversoul is ever going to abandon its own. That's not how this works. Uh, remember, this is a this is a interactive medium that reciprocates exactly what is expected of it. Meaning the construct itself is going to feed you the very problems that you expect to experience. It's also going to feed feed an individual who is vibrating on a higher frequency the very insulations and protections that they expect to experience. If if an individual immortal soul in the construct right now believes that the oversoul will always provide an out, then I promise you the oversoul is going to provide that out and override anything the construct is able to do. Yeah, this is a relationship. I've said this many times in my videos. This is a relationship and you need to regard your interface with reality itself as a relationship. And I promise you, you're going to see totally different things unfold in your life. Yeah. Any, anybody who is in the struggle, fighting by the ways of the world and all, all immersed into all the dungeon programming aspects will always experience all the problems that come with those aspects. Yeah, this is why I don't engage in cryptocurrencies. I don't engage in the stock markets. I don't engage in all these things because every bit of these are dungeon programming traps. They're set for you specifically to engage in that activity. So once you're engaged in that activity, you become more and more blind to all the other opportunities that have been readily available to you if you just had remained open to them. Yeah, I'm not falling for any of these traps. If you expect great things in your life, great things will be projected into your life to experience. If you expect that there's going to be any type of resistance to the things that you want, then 
resistance is going to be edited into the protocols that govern your reality tunnels. This is the this is the reality we live in right now. Yeah, it's 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 and like I said earlier, it is it is so simple that that we have an absolute grammatical inability to convey it in its most simplest forms. We don't have the vocabulary to explain how simple this interactive dynamic is. Any attempt to describe it complicates it. So, guys, I'm gonna have to stop there. I'm getting tired now. May have bit off more than I could chew. That's three hours and 31 minutes. I appreciate you guys hanging with me. You can hit that like button. Uh, I do have some things to share with you real quick. I'm going to share my screen. Move from studio. Uh, I, I need Somebody asked me to do this on a live video because they keep forgetting and they lose track. And I don't know why they just can't go to my website. I told them twice. But you know what? I'm just going to share my screen real quick. and. Uh, let you and, and there's a link in the description box right now because I've tried to simplify everything so I don't have to always talk about it. I don't really promote hardly anything, but I'm going to share my screen right now and show you these real quick. First of all, that's the book tree www.thebooktree.com. This is 50% of my education came from the old, old reprinted books from the book tree. All right. It's real simple. 1-800-700-TREE. They will send you a free PDF catalog of thousands of books. Next, Archaic's Timeline of the Ancient World is an actual chronology typed up in order with charts for you, for you to see. This is for people who want to understand the, the, uh, the, uh, the unfolding of historical events, the resets, uh, the, the major events in world history. This is it. Archaic's Timeline. Uh, this is not Chronicon. Chronicon is over a, well over a thousand pages. This is just a simple timeline. It's, it's, it's pretty big, but it's a simple timeline. That, that gives you the exact date and what happened. It, it's like abbreviated. All right. The, the link is in the, here, this right here is a download on Podia. It's 337 high resolution charts. It's also in the description box. It's just a simple, you just go to the link index and hit it, hit it from my website on the link index. Here, Archaics TV. Uh, Archaics TV, we got we got over a hundred videos in there now. This is a uh, this is a lot of stuff we just don't discuss on YouTube, but um, yeah, me, Big John, and I are, are about to release more videos on our KX TV. It's a lot. It's a lot of information, and the chat threads are off the charts. Yeah, the chat threads of everybody engaging in the chat on our KX TV is, is amazing. I, I learn a lot just reading the chat. So that's our KX TV. How to join our KX TV? It's in the description box. So uh, also, you guys have been asking about, I never stopped. I just don't ever promote them. But I never stopped providing uh, the Super Pack and the Survival Pack are both huge. I keep adding stuff to them. But I went ahead and <coughs> combined them into the same drive. They're huge. It's now called the Super Survival Pack. I just put them all together in one drive. Same price. Archaics Library Drive. You can't read that many books in your life. It's impossible. You got to cherry pick what you want to read. It's over 7,100 books. <clears throat> the old photos archive, it, it, it's, uh, this one is 32,400 images exactly. I know because I had somebody put 100 images in each file. It's, it's 32,400 images from old books and all that. Old photos drive. Also, Chronicon is now available. It's one single PDF, but it's huge. It's long. So Chronicon is now available for those for those uh, who, want, who want to check it out. If you're waiting for the paperbacks, because a lot of you have not ordered Chronicon because you want to wait for the paperbacks, I get it. But you're going to be waiting some years. Paul Tice can only publish so much a year. So the pre-flood world is supposed to be published in the fall. But the rest of Chronicon, it'll take 2025 and 2026 to finally get it in paperback. So I just wanted to show you 
you want all these links and all that, just go to the one single link in the description box called the link index. It will take you to the website where you can click on anything you're interested in. So I hope that helped. Let's see, I'm done. I'm gonna remove that, stop sharing. All right. I really do appreciate you guys hanging with me. I was a long one tonight. Thursday, we'll be back with another presentation. But uh, I'm going to hit that fabulous outro, guys. And I will see you next time. Much love. Much love to the community.